we ride. Let's put our hatchets out of sight. Let's put our feelings on the shelf. Love our neighbor as ourselves. Let's do our God and country right. Let's put the plow back in the school. Start living by the golden rule. Count our blessings one by one. Thank the Lord for what He's done. Let's do our God and country right. I remember well the story of George's cherry tree. The pledge, the prayer each morning. Welcome everybody, even the haters and the losers, of which there are many, to the latest episode of Presby Cast. Uh, jam-packed. I'm uh, not going to do a long-winded dead airfield introduction, because why? So, uh, Chortles, kick it off. Well, here we are, continuing, uh, a de- I don't know if it was supposed to be a debate on Reform Forum, uh, but it turned into one. And two of the parties there uh, from that uh, uh, show are here. Uh, Dr. Daryl Hart, Tim and Klein, and uh, they, uh, I think one of, one of our guests suggested that uh, this be continued and that there be seconds. Uh, I assumed Timon's second would be uh, Stephen Wolf, who it is, and uh, Daryl chose his fellow Hillsdale uh, Professor Miles Smith the fourth. I have to get the fourth in there. And um, we've got at least three PhDs and a JD or something like that here. Uh, so this is the most uh, education we've ever had on the show at one time. I, but only I, one I, com major who graduated in four from a state university. So Well, the Ivy League of, of the West Coast. Um, and I used to have a PhD. I had a post hole digger when I had uh, my 17-acre farm. For all you, you know, rad Rad, Trad, Chad, Homesteaders. Uh, I was doing that a long time ago. I had sheep and a tractor and a bush hog and a box blade. I even had a finish mower. So uh, I've been there, I've done that, and I've moved on. Um, But we are going to move on into this discussion of uh, church and state. And that's the the biggest umbrella uh, term I could find for it. Um, But we're going to talk about any number number of uh, related issues uh, Christian nationalism will have to come up. The spirituality of the church, that was the the topic of the uh, Reform Forum show that spawned uh, this discussion. So that, that certainly touches on it as well. So let me introduce uh, our panel. Uh, first of all, uh, by seniority, Dr. Daryl Hart. Unmute yourself, Daryl, and tell us uh, what your, what, what your reason for being here is. Um, I, I want to find out more from these young whippersnappers. What's going on? What's wrong with, what's wrong with the world? Okay. Fair enough. And we'll, um, you've, you've, uh, you've been around the block on these things a few times. You, you, you've written, uh, many books. You're a church historian and, uh, and you're a, a political historian as and, well. And I'm a boomer and, and somehow, <laughs> The, uh, the the old ways of mid twentieth century America just don't make sense anymore, and I don't um, I don't know why that is. <clears throat> all right, we'll, we'll we'll get to that. So, uh, Timon, uh, we'll we'll take you number two. So unmute well, yourself. Well, everybody's older than me, so in, in order of seniority, um, I'm here to because uh, because I actually, d- despite what what may have. Uh, you know how spicy it got in the reform forum debate. I actually like Daryl quite a bit. I like how prickly he is and disagreeable. I, that's a that's an important trait in my opinion. Uh, so I wanted I wanted some more. Um, so I'm back for round two. 
uh, to talk with Daryl because I think it's good fun. Um, and I, I think what's wrong with America is probably mullets. I'm not for the resurgence of those. Um, so, so we can discuss that as well. Well, I lived through the 80s at mulletable age and never had one. Uh, not everyone, not everyone can say that. Nor did I. I was just, I was just uh, make making fun of somebody on Twitter. But I wish you did have one, or we could. I'm sure someone can Photoshop that. But. All right, Daryl's uh, second, if you will, is uh, Miles. Miles, you've been here before. Unmute yourself. Oh, he's my first. <laughs> And a uh, former uh, turncoat, former Presbyterian, now an Anglican, he might know a thing or two about about uh, establishment and history and all that. So, Miles. Well, I, I want to uh, say I, I, all these guys I think are interesting voices, and I think they're worth listening to. Um, uh, Time and, and Stephen both have uh, interesting things to say. They both have made really bad mistakes, Time and being a Tennessee fan, and uh, Stephen, unfortunately, choosing to go to West Point and not Annapolis, so uh, uh, that's neither neither their faults. Uh, but uh, I'm 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 interested in the talk. Uh, I uh, I think my offering to the group is I'm the only person who hasn't been dunked, uh, who hasn't been immersed. I don't I, actually I don't know Stephen. I, I don't know whether you were you were dunked in your in your pre uh, in your pre true true uh, true Presbyterian years, uh, but I know Timon's a former Baptist. Um, and so I'm just kind of curious, uh, like what, you know, what are the terms of our argument? I think there's a lot of different things. There's a lot of different discussions going on and we tend to conflate them. So I'm, cu I'm curious as it's sort of what, what are we actually all sort of talking about and debating? Um, a, a friend who uh, thinks very highly of Stephen's work jokingly told me recently, he, he wants to thank Stephen for writing the best Anglican uh, political theology that's been written. Uh, in the 21st century and to invite Stephen to just uh, give up the ghost and come join us. So uh, Stephen, this is my offering, be become an Anglican, come join us. Uh, but uh, all of these guys have written interesting things. And so I'm fascinated by, I think this is really cool. Uh, I, I would love to see us all sit down and talk uh, more like this. Um, and uh, so that's why I'm here. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's, uh, it'll be, it'll be fun. And I have iced tea just so Resby can know I'm committed uh for as long as it takes. So, I I also have uh, an iced beverage tonight. So, clinking in uh, solidarity. <laughs> All right, Stephen. Uh, before Miles runs away with it and just keeps talking, you should probably uh, introduce yourself. Okay, I guess I I was dunked actually. I went from atheist to being dunked, and then became <laughs> vegetarian. So that's my that's my my journey. Uh, but yeah, uh, Annapolis didn't take me. So, but, uh, that, that's why it wasn't a choice. <laughs> that was my first, I shouldn't say that, but that's true. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know what else there is. Uh, yeah, I'm here. G glad to be here and, uh, ready to get going. All right. Well, uh, a word on perspectives. Now, let me, let me, I think I know the answers to this. Miles, are are you an officer of sorts at the? Are you you've got some role in your Anglican congregation? Is that right? Yeah, I'm I'm a vestryman, which is maps on to basically a Presbyterian deacon. Um, so that's essentially we're not ordained, um, we're lay people, um, and I, I suppose deacons are kind of some Presbyterian deacons are kind of a mix of ordained and lay lady. They're not they're not ruling elders. Um, so yeah, I am uh, I am a a lay officer in the Diocese of the Living Word in the Anglican Church in North America. And so my canonical uh, boundaries are set by those respected bodies. Okay, Timon, I think you go to an OPC church, uh, but are, are you an officer, have any formal role? No, no responsibility here whatsoever. Um, no, the, yeah, I've, no, I've never been an officer, never ordained. Um, I, I'm still technically a member of the, the uh, Presbyt uh, Philadelphia Presbytery, um, but I but I live in Florida now. So. Uh, oh, okay. I didn't know that. Well, you you got to transfer your membership. You got you got <laughs> you got to be part of a local church. You got to do that. <laughs> we we if if you were in my church, we'd hound you. Okay, we wouldn't let you be unaffiliated. And that's, Stephen, that's, that's why I didn't come to come to yours. Yeah. yeah Stephen, that's yeah. yeah, it's very well, Baptist. No, no. Membership <laughs> is very Presbyterian. 
And uh, uh, and Stephen, you're a member of an OPC church. I I just moved, if, if, you know, six seven months ago. I'm sure it's not fast enough, but still. Mm. Stephen, you're an OPC church member. Uh, I'm in a, I'm in a Nay Park church. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So um, somewhere in North Carolina, where you live. Yeah. 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 All right. And of course, Miles is from North Carolina. <clears throat> so yeah. one difference. I'm I from mean, Sal Salisbury, Stephen. If you know where that is on the map now, so. So as one of, one of the perspective differences here, I mean, some of us are going to look at this more theologically. Some of our, some of us are going to look at it as political philosophy. Uh, but church officers have a, a <laughs> I think Daryl would agree, a different perspective on these things. There are pastoral implications to all these things. Um, and so that's the direction I come from. And uh, uh, Daryl, any thoughts on that? Because you're a, a long-time ruling elder. And and clerk of session. Um, I, I just, I, that, I, means you're a, that means you're a sucker. <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, I, I'm probably, I would like to think there's pastoral implications, though in my own uh, congregation, these matters don't come up, which is fine. Um, although I, I would like to know where some people stand, just how they think about contemporary society and w how what kind of frustrations they have. Uh, but I, I, I do come at this from a church historian's perspective and, um, and I've, I'm at the tail end of writing a book on Presbyterianism and British politics. And um, I think I have some feel for the different iterations of Presbyterians in, re in regard to different nation states or kingdoms, as the case may be. And, um, and, I, and I do think the American Presbyterian tradition has been a, a good one. And I, I, I'm, I'm here to defend it as both churchman and historian. All right, well, let's jump right in because I, I believe everyone here, except for uh, Miles, is uh, in uh, uh, Napark affiliated, probably Presbyterian at that. And uh, we have a little thing in Presbyterianism called the Westminster Confession uh, in, in the PCA, uh, which I'm a part of, in the OPC, which Daryl is a part of. We use uh, a version, an American version of the standards. And uh, one of the, the first thing I really noticed about uh, when Christian nationalism started hitting online was that there were a lot of guys saying, well, we don't, we don't want anything to do with the American revisions. So I think the, I think we could probably talk all night about this, but what about uh, the American revisions to the confession, which removes establishment from the picture? It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't ignore or utterly denigrate um, the, um, uh, the magistrate, as we'll see, there's uh, 23 3 is really the, the money paragraph. Um, but <clears throat> so I ask you, uh, well, in fact, we'll, we'll just start from, we'll start from the other end. Stephen, do you have a problem with the American revisions to the Westminster Confession of Faith? Uh, so I, I don't really have a, a problem with it necessarily. I, I actually don't think that it requires disestablishment given its reading, if you, you know, reading it correctly. Um, it doesn't say, it, it says that you, uh, you can't give any preference to, to a denomination, but it kind of qualifies that with, by saying in such a manner that all ecclesi ecclesiastical persons, whatever shall enjoy, you know, unquestioned liberty uh, without violence or danger. So like that, that seems to say that you just can't preference by harming uh, one denomination uh, over over or not by without you can't do violence or danger or threaten one denomination. But that doesn't seem to preclude an actual establishment itself. I mean, I think all this all it actually accomplishes is to say, well, you can't you can't persecute the Baptists. So if if they are a church of our common Lord. Which would is a good press uh, a good kind of Protestant sense of ecclesiology in which we're not, you know, we're not uh, to be part of the true church. You're not they don't have to be aligned with one institution, but you have to be uh, you have to be aligned with our, our common Lord. 
Um, and so I, I don't think it actually necessarily requires disestablishment. I think, but I also do think that it is fitting for for the the American conception of religious liberty. So I, I don't really have a problem with it in itself. But again, I would say that it doesn't actually do as much as what I'm guessing Daryl and I don't know what Miles thinks on this, but I don't think it does as much as they think. Well, no. I'm gonna, so I'm going to jump in, Brad. Go ahead. Since time has already added me. But how do you read there at the end of that? It is the duty of mag civil magistrates to protect the person and good name of all their people in such an effectual manner as no person be suffered upon pretense of religion. You change the screen. It's a sign. Um, you got it. Right. But I lost my place. <laughs> nope. <clears throat> upon pretense of religion or of infidelity. They're talking about everyone there. They're not talking merely about Protestants. Yeah. I, I that seems to, do, to be saying that they, that the, the civil magistrate should not tolerate someone who's going to attack another person for their religion. So if you really didn't like Baptists, he's saying, okay, well, you can't let the Presbyterian attack the Baptists or the Congregationalists attack the Presbyterian. Or it's the, not it, saying it, it's, but it's also it's saying that everyone should be protected from other people. Even infidelity um, should be protected. Yeah, from like a vigilante kind of, uh, uh, you know, from, from one person saying you're an atheist and I'm going to punch you in the face, something like that. But Wait, I, I, have, I, I, have, I, I don't see how it precludes even the suppression of atheism or blasphemy um, from by law. So I think this is just protecting people, and making sure there isn't sort of religious anarchy. Uh, I, and, I have one question of cl clarity. How are we reading infidelity also, right? Just we're, we're talking about ecclesial context here. We're not talking about sexual infidelity. Oh, no, it's definitely, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's not holding to the faith. There's no doubt about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, just making sure. So, uh, uh, I, I really, <laughs> Stephen, I've read your book, believe it or not. I've done the reading. I actually have a hardback, which, I mean, a, a softback, which I bought, used. I have the, uh, the Kindle edition, which I got for free. And I think I have it in a third version somehow. Oh, I've got the audio book. Well, then you owe me a review then if you got it for free. But uh, well, yeah. <laughs> just kidding. You might not. You might not want it. But okay. you know, no, in, in, in your in your uh, in your book, I mean, you actually say, and you were talking. This is you're talking about Protestant here. And of course, Daryl's question was about Catholicism. Are you going to tolerate Catholics in your ideal uh, Christian nation? Uh, of which a, a key part is the Christian prince who can who can punish heresy, and approve and call synods, and approve of uh, uh, synodical uh, deliverances, the the work of church councils. Um, I don't. I think you're soft peddling your position here. You want a Protestant Christian nation, uh, and and maybe you know maybe a little more reformed and a little more pedo Baptist than uh, than Baptist. And what you say here, it doesn't require that we disestablish. In other words, have you know a variety of churches. So saying it, you, it doesn't require disestablishment implies that establishment is preferable. Um, and I, I, I just the, what yeah. I hear, what I hear in reading your book is different from what you just said in my in the way I'm hearing it. Yeah. So I, I don't want I don't want to make this all about uh, my book, but yeah. So what I was doing in that section is I was I was talking about what's permissible by principle, not necessarily what's required. So the whole book is most of the book is just general political theory. So I do think it's permissible to punish heretics, to punish blasphemy, to call synods, do all the things I mentioned. But that's that's a matter of just principle, not necessarily part of the tradition of the people. I'm also I think what, one of the misunderstandings is that I'm a, I'm a particularist, I'm a paleoconservative which means I think that the application of principles have to be grounded in the characteristics of the people. And I think there is an American tradition. And so when understanding, and that, that's why I said that this, this document, this revision would make sense in the American context. And that's why I don't have a, any sort of great, uh, take great issue with it. Um, and so I, whether it's establishment or just, I mean, this might be even something time and I don't 100% agree on, but I'm okay with this establishment um, in certain cultural contexts. So I think in 19th century America, it worked. 
um, for the most part, or it was, it was the, the conditions were there for disestablishment. I don't think that's true for every era. Uh, but again, it's it's part of the the characteristics and um, of, of the people, uh, and that's how you apply the the, the principles. So I'm not like backpedaling or soft pedaling or whatever. Uh, it was just it's how I set up. It's how I it's how I present the argument. First, you have to establish what's permissible. You have to set up the principles, and um, which is what I did with without apology and constantly saying, "But I don't mean this. I don't mean that." I didn't you don't I didn't do that. Um, and that's why there's all this confusion, unfortunately. But um, but then when you actually again we go to apply those principles, uh, if you have a tradition of religious liberty that works, which I think it did work for a long time in the United States, then uh, it would be inappropriate or it would be unsuitable for you to, uh, you know, have a sort of establishment that excludes other denominations. Okay, so we'll, we'll so, talk about this more later. But yeah, I, ask yeah, my, yeah. I ask myself, am I, am I in the wrong with focusing on the, the Christian prince? But as I read your book at the, from the beginning, I mean, the point of all this it, it depends on the Christian prince. It's the telos. Of your of your argument, but that's the only way to reach the ideal is to have this Christian prince, and you assign to the Christian prince the power to call synods. That's not in that's not compatible with the American revisions of the Westminster Confession. Uh, that 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 right does not exist uh, under under the American version of the Westminster well, Confession. It, of faith. it doesn't it doesn't negate it, right? It just right. it just it just subtracts it. So. Um, that this goes also for the the section on religious liberty. All it does is just remove it. So it would actually be improper for you guys when there's a candidate to say, "Hey, you need to take an exception if you hold to the original confession on that matter," because just it doesn't negate it. It doesn't require you to deny him the right to call a synod. It doesn't require you uh, to deny the power of the civil magistrate to censor false religion or you know erroneous opinions. Well, there are so, people who read to register those exceptions. Uh, and well, they, they I, shouldn't I, have to. That's my point. Okay. Well, it's just because I, something's I, I not present I, I, doesn't mean it's. Wait, but I, why? Why wouldn't they have to register an exception? Since because the, it's not negated in the text. Just because it's not pre, it's not present. So why would they have to take well, an exception to something not required of them to, uh, to deny? Plumbing is it in the text? I mean, I don't understand because it was in the text and they took it out. It's not like, oh, some magic happened. I mean, they actually took it out. So I don't understand. There's much more intentionality about the, the revision than what you're suggesting that it doesn't negate it. It does negate what 1646 did. No, I just removed the text. I mean, you're 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 pressing, you're adding to something that's just not there. No, you're not you're adding. Requiring you subtract it to negate, you so, to deny something that isn't required in the text for them to deny. Or yeah, you, you know, you're requiring an exception of something that is not actually required explicitly in the text. But this, which does I think, not, would be a violation of their conscience. Based, but upon this does not affirm. Theory. This does not affirm 1646. It if they want to affirm, it. it doesn't negate it. It does because they took it out. So removing <laughs> if, it is is it constitutes oh, you, a negation. So you're telling me if they take away the Second Amendment, and then I can still hold a gun because they didn't negate it. Yeah, <laughs> unless there's a law otherwise, a positive law otherwise. Yeah, you'd have a right to carry the gun. No, you wouldn't have the right. The right isn't there in the Constitution anymore. Okay. That's Unless there's a lot to the contrary, then you are per permitted to have my liberty to. Yeah, it's the same thing here. I mean, removing something could simply mean we're no longer requiring that point as a point of subscription. You remove it saying now it's open. So negating doesn't necessarily logically require a implied um, denial. It could just as well logically imply that now you're free to hold either position. Well, we still have we still have the line that says, "And as Jesus as a, and as Jesus Christ hath appointed a regular government and discipline in His church, no law of any commonwealth should interfere with, let which means prevent, hinder, 
uh, the due exercise thereof among the voluntary members of any denomination of Christians. And that, that includes uh, the officers of the denomination. So if, uh, if, if we're saying, uh, if, if a magistrate called a synod, we would be right to, to ignore that, Christian prince or not. Can I ask a question? What if a magistrate, uh, the the churches did in the 19th century, obey the magistrate's call for fast days? Why? I mean, was there univer there was universal compliance with that? I can't imagine that. It was it was it was standard. There, there, there was not the well, Presbyterian ministers did not get in their pulpits and say. The governor's told us to do this, but screw you, we're not going to do it. There's typically an adherence of of of, of you can okay. you can Google. Typically, tip, I don't doubt that it was typically yeah. done, but it was not it was not uh, law to every Christian. I don't believe. No, it All wasn't right, well, so, law, but it was understood to be a, a prerogative of a governor in his a, a, past, a, in his a, a state a state governor. Well, and presidents too. Okay. All right, so we've. we've well, I mean, uh, the, the point being here is that for a long time, you guys, as OPC and PCA um, members, have required of candidates something that is not required by the text, and that that is actually a big deal. It, you're you're requiring something that is not required of the text. So you have all these ministers who have to declare their exceptions and go before and explain themselves when they really do not need to do that. And I and anyone's watching this, they should push back on that. They should push back upon people. Who require something of them that's arbitrary and unnecessary. Um, so, well, so if so, if I go, you've into, done it, Daryl. You've done this. Have you not done this before? Have I not? Have I done what? Have you required exceptions that are not the OPC uh, required doesn't of do, the text? The OPC doesn't do accept exceptions. Oh, okay. That's a, no, it doesn't. Good. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. It does examinations and whether the person passes or not, that's, that's, that's the way it goes. It doesn't okay, have, I take that back. I, I thought this had happened before, but okay. Yeah. But so if I go into the RPCNA where they have the original confession and, and the teaching of the civil magistrate, I can just say, Oh no, I'm going to, I'm going to abide by the American confession because it doesn't negate it. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, you can do that. No, no, I don't. I don't think so. Actually, I, I mean, that's, I not, gonna, that's not going to happen, Stephen. Oh, that's okay, just not okay. going to happen. No, no, hold right. on. I think that Let's... this is not a. It's not comparable in that sense because Stephen's argument is that the the rewritten American edition does not negate the prescriptions that are in the original to the magistrate in terms of his duty, uh, Kirkusakra, right? So, so these these sort of external things, including calling of uh, of synods, uh, so it doesn't negate them. So it allows you to continue to to think those things or believe those things uh, without requiring an exemption. If you flip it the other way and you use the original standards, it does require you to affirm those things. Okay. And so you yeah. can't leave them out. So it's not the same, the same option. It's not available, right? Like this is not, it's incongruent in that, that comparison. That, that doesn't make any sense unless makes you can go. Sense. No, no, it doesn't do make perfect sense because one communion gave up the 1646 language. And now you're saying, oh, but it's illegitimate right. for you to require somebody to hold to the 1789. But no, if you go no, if you sorry. go to the RPCNA, it's it's okay for them to require 1646. It's yeah, because yeah, it, it's more robust. As I lose. No, 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 that's not what I'm saying, Daryl. It's because it's it's a more robust requirement in terms of the magistrate's duties in the 1646. And so you can't leave those out, right? You have to if, if assuming you're not allowed to take exceptions you have to affirm the text and it does include those. But if you switch over to the American revisions, it no longer requires those. So you don't have to affirm them, but it also doesn't negate them. And so it is okay if you do believe them, but it's not a, a requirement for uh, subscription and uh, ordination, presumably. You see, you see what I mean? But it does negate that the magistrate has the power to call synods, to sit at them, and to declare what's biblical. It does negate that. Where well, does it negate a, that? It, it's always, because, that's because always it, been my understanding. It's I mean, there I mean, in 1646, and that's gone. It, right, I know it's gone, but it's... it's okay, so, so here's... It's, 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 if, it's if not an explicit... Hold, hold, hold on, let me say, I mean, I to use say your Second Amendment, your the Second Amendment example... A, uh, uh, sorry, a, a theoretical or uh, legal or philosophical political perspective here, and a church perspective. 
Daryl's telling you how it works in churches. I'm telling you how no, it's done. No, I don't really and, think it's a well, difference that, that's between unjust. perspectives. It I think not it's a, work that way. Well, then you you need okay. to file a complaint with. Uh, okay, I mean, but but I don't really think it's a matter of logic. With... You're requiring a denial no, that no, it's not it's, a, it's yeah. a matter of reading texts. It's in there in one text, if, and it's not there in the other. Correct. Yeah. If, correct. if it's so absent, all, isn't all this if, is sort if of you take the N word out of Tom Sawyer, right? It's not like, oh, I can still read it there. Somebody wanted it taken out. So somebody wanted it taken out of the 1646. You're not being fair to text. If it if it is take if it's taken out, it can mean two things. One, no, it means it, no, you it have, doesn't. It can't it, mean it, that. It, it, it means what it means. Simply that you are free to either affirm or deny. It's not because the text it's in order to subscribe to the confession. You have to affirm and you affirm what it affirms and deny what it denies. If it doesn't have either a, an affirmation or denial, then you're not required to affirm or deny. Therefore, you can have either one. It's perfectly okay, logical. So that's how you read a text. And that's exactly how everyone in the PCA or any Presbyterian denomination the denial of 17, should read this. 1646 doesn't require the denial of 1789 because there's no language of affirmation and denial in either. That is something that your is in your head, and you're imposing on these two texts. How would forty six require denial of eighty eight? It's anachronistic. So, all we're saying is there's been some things removed that are no longer required for you to affirm. There's lots of things not including in the confession and the included in the confession, so you're not required to affirm them as a matter of membership and ordination. Um, but it's it, it's not saying one way or the other. And so if there's not also a prescription that you deny certain things, those things are also up for grabs. I don't, I don't really understand why, All right. where the confusion right. so is you're making, between us. Because you're making it more confused than it needs to be. I don't think so. So the I think your Second Amendment. The Constitution doesn't say you can have a monarch or you cannot have a monarch. We do have a you monarch. Don't, but it, it does it, say that. It's, it says you every state's required a Republican form of government. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna move on from that. We what, have well, a, federal Miles, as you know, Republican, uh, republic, classical republicanism can allow monarchy, and right. John Adams thought we had a monarch too. But you know, I, I know what you mean. Yeah. So, anyway. All right, so we're gonna move on from that. Um, Daryl and I are telling you how these. Well, I mean, I, let me let me just ask this question: Can your kids do anything that, that unless you tell them not to do something, they're allowed to do things? Is that is that it? That's that's not the way it works. Um, we have a the, the Westminster Confession is not really that long. It's much longer than the Baptist Confession, uh, like the the Baptist Faith and Message. Uh, but it's it's fairly it's modest. Uh, but we do try to stick to it. I'll, I'll tell you how it's read in the courts, and I don't think it's unjust. Uh, but there is a conscience issue. If a man, if, and most people are going to be granted this exception in the PCA. But if we were convinced that the man couldn't minister in good conscience uh, and that he would uh, constantly teach contrary to what we believe the confession says, that would be a Wait, problem. Where does it say it? Wait, what is he teaching contrary? Can you read what, what it is? Re Excuse read me. Specific, read specifically in the confession what well, he is teaching if, contrary. If, read if the line. Gonna, read the line. If he's, if he's going to if he's gonna stand in the pulpit every Sunday in his pastoral prayer, uh, damn— uh, the the den denomination in the country for not having an established church, and, and we can discern that. And you know, we're not just going to ask him if he says, "I don't agree with chapter twenty three." There's a lot more questions that follow after that. Um, no, I, just, I, we, I would we do ask take... which text is he contradicting. But okay, I'll just I'll, I'll leave it at that. All right. Well, let's uh, let's move into the. Uh, Wait, let's before mo we move on, I do, would like to just say here, if if you cannot read chapter twenty three three the American revision, or if you can read that in a way that allows Christian nationalism, the debate's gone. It's just completely over. That's not what that confession, that's not what that revision does. That revision has in views toleration for Jews, Roman Catholics, and infidels. I read and the text. Is, I think it actually, read read the text actually, where it says that. Read the text. Where well, does it say that? Okay. It, yeah, it, it is the duty it of it is it is the duty of civil magistrates, according to their own profession. Uh, I'm sorry. 
It is the duty of civil magistrates to protect the person and good name of all their people, all their people. Yeah, but that's a, not in, that's, by in doing such what? an effectual manner that no person be suffered either upon pretense of religion or of infidelity to offer any indignity, indignity, violence, abuse, or injury to any other person whatsoever, and to take order, and this is the magistrate, the magistrate, this is not individuals, is to take order uh, that all religious and ecclesial, ecclesiastical assemblies be held without molestation or disturbance. And the reason um, why that's impor is important, because Timon and Stephen, you have both accused me being an Anabaptist or whatever, and you guys stand with the Puritans and Calvin and Geneva, and that did not hold in, in Massachusetts or Geneva. They, they were executing heretics in Geneva, and you know that. And they would not let Lutherans or Quakers minister in Massachusetts Bay. And so you're not being, you're not really being I, honest here. Yeah, I think, no, I think we are. I mean, I think Stephen laid it out, uh, very well at the beginning that part of what we've argued for in our own different ways is what's permissible in principle or actually good in principle, but that's not getting into what's necessary according to prudence uh, through concessions for the other duties that uh, a magistrate might have based on the makeup of his polity or kind of the cards that are dealt to him. Uh, but I do think it, in this text, I mean, essentially outlawing religious vigilantism is not quite the, the pluralist pluralist toleration, well, it's not even toleration, it's this sort of modern conception of re religious liberty that requires, uh, you know, sort of broad uh, ability to express and practice anything and everything you want. Um, th this, I mean, fits perfectly with the time of the late 18th century, which is a, a certainly a pan-Protestant presumption, uh, but even expanded to Christians who profess our common Lord those are the ones that are get, that are in view here, but that doesn't mean you can go kill. You know, assuming there was a bunch of Muslims there, you can just kill them on your on your own, right? The magistrate does have a duty to protect, uh, to maintain order and to protect people. And maybe we can even uh, extend and grant that it means you can't run in wantonly to, you know, a synagogue and and start you know throwing, you know, trash everywhere and. and you know, molesting and disturbing their their assemblies, assuming ecclesiastical assemblies applies to that kind of situation. Uh, but that's that's not quite the concession that I think you're making it out to be, Daryl, where it's we've plopped down this sort of, uh, you know, 20th century post. No, 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 I'm not I'm not going to. the. No, you guys keep beating spirituality of the church guys up with you've departed from Knox and Calvin and Winthrop. And well, you guys are not standing with Knox and Calvin and Winthrop either. So no, let's be, let's are, be, I, um, I think... no, no. So you want, you want to keep Jews and Roman Catholics and Quakers and Lutherans out of your ideal Christian society. I think it'd be certainly, you have to say, if you believe in a Christian commonwealth and the tradition, including the guys you just cited and many more, that that's certainly permissible. In, depending no, on I, no, I'm saying, what do you want? I'm not talking about permissibility. You're, I'm saying you, you, you think that that American Presbyterians sort of lost connection to those old guys yeah, and you're, yeah, you're, you're holding so. them up as a standard by which to judge the liberal Presbyterians that have gone afterwards, the David French's and everybody else. But now you're sort of just saying, oh, it's kind of permissible. But, no, no, it's permissible and, and good, but that doesn't mean it's everywhere. So you like think heretics to, should be executed? I think they can be, and it depends on the context, and it depends on, according to prudence, what the magistrate right, well, is able to do. It sounds like you're being a bit, This is very standard uh, political theory in this regard. I mean, this is oh, a lot of why on. we Ex appeal to the guys we're appealing to. Executing heretics to is standard political philosophy. Yeah, it can be. I mean, Turret's in a Plato. Course. I mean, okay, okay. Plato. we don't yeah. have a time. Do, do we need a time machine? We need we need what I call the prot tub time machine, and then the, then this works. But we are where we are, uh, and I, I don't I I don't find the uh, the the last section of this paragraph does not support uh, the execution of heretics by not by uh, you know about, by the by the prince. Whatever that is. I, I don't see anywhere that it negates it. So it, it would be permissible. Right. 
So one sure. one of the things I wanted to do tonight, and of course I can show it from I can show it in Stephen's book very easily. The goal of all this, at least for Stephen's pro, uh, 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 concept, is a heresy punishing Christian prince. And so, if you want that, and, and the ability to discriminate or or to uh, not to disfavor or not privilege. Uh, those who are unorthodox, Roman Catholics, Jews, you name it. If that's what people want, that's what you guys are offering. I mean, I, well, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, I respond to that I, I, again. Like, I, I, it's, um, I tried to write a systematic, coherent Christian political theory, which means that I will detail what a, a political leader can do in principle, what is permissible for him to do. And so I made an argument that, yes, for arch heretics, it is permissible at times for execution or, or banishment or these things. OK, and that, that's permissibility. That's not like I want to enact utopia and start rounding up, you know, I don't know, Baptists or something like I see on Twitter every day. Uh, it's just it's permissible um, in terms of the American context as from for a long time. That would not be appropriate. And I don't think it'd be appropriate now. I have friends who are Roman Catholics and they no longer want to, um, you know, submit us to the papacy politically anymore. So I'm very willing to work with them and even in a Christian, creating Christian society. So I, I think there's just a failure to understand that it's, I, I'm not like a post millennial theonomist who lists the absolute rules of what some, of what a political leader must do or ought to do. It's may do, it's can do. Um, given the circumstances and prudence. So you'll see me use can and may throughout that. I ever say must or ought to. Um, I okay, do think so they if, ought if to it, promote it, true religion, but how you promote true religion is different in different contexts, depending on the demographic diversity, religious diversity, or, um, and all sorts of things. So, so it, this is, is it, just is a it, matter of, of laying out your political principles and then looking at the characteristics on the ground and saying, how do we achieve the ends sought in political society? Which I think is a, a, a more a greater good than just your temporal, you know, make sure they have their fat in their bellies, but also they are spiritually fed as well. How, given the circumstances, how do you enact a set of policies that would conduce to that end? And it'll be different in different places. Which again, this this idea has been it's recognized all the way back in Althusius's Politica that you, that a magistrate you know, like he's opposing the Roman Catholics who want to just kill everyone because they're heretics. And he's saying, wait, OK, you have to be prudent in how you're going to steer this ship. Otherwise, I think he uses the, that metaphor. But anyway, um, so that again, I, I think it's it's not fair to take what I say is permissible and then saying it must that I, I'm saying it must be that. But, All right. So but this is, me, just a, just, is this just a thought experiment? No, it's established. It's, it's a matter of doing political philosophy. I don't know how like. No, but it's, Stephen, this is political please, philosophy. I don't know what, it's please, not like I'm not a post mill. Like I, I, I don't want to. Stephen, offend please be honest. Guy. Please be honest. Is it permissible then to depart from Calvin, Knox, and Winthrop on political theory and not be called an Anabaptist? You use. I think that if you think you that the, if you think the that the church is an alternative society, that it's something that's the, the sole. Um, separate like redemption is only within this very limited sphere and you don't see the civil society as something that can can order and contribute indirectly to that then yeah that's an anabaptist assumption so i know but really i'm saying that. is it is it permissible for a presbyterian to depart from calvin and knox and winthrop you you so you want to talk about what's permissible. You're only doing political theory, but then in your arguments sometimes about history, it's like, oh, you guys departed. You you you've given up on the Protestant magisterial tradition. Oh, you've become liberals. Oh, you've become David French. So you're not really talking about something that's permissible at that point. You're talking. You're using the past and what's the right way against the wrong way, and it's not merely what's permissible at that point. You're doing rhetorical tap dancing the way Timon did on the Reform Forum podcast. Let's have some no. more Jimmy Cagney. <laughs> no, it's if if you deny the conceptual possibility of a Christian nation, okay, if, if you don't think nations can be Christian, 
which I don't, I, I'm assuming you believe that. I, I, I apologize if you actually do think that's possible. Then, yeah, you've departed. If you think there cannot be, properly speaking, Christian civil rulers, meaning that they are cognizant of the Christian faith and act for it, then, yeah, I think you've departed from all those guys. Um, same thing with if you don't think there's Christian civil law, it, uh, distinctive, distinctively Christian, then, yeah, I think you've departed from those guys. I affirm all those things. Except that I understand that if Presbyterians are 2% of the population, they're not going to establish some confessional state. And so in order for them to worship freely and unmolested and um, then, and but at the same time, don't want degeneracy and they want some sort of um, Christian society, then they have to work with the Baptists and the Anglican, you know, even the Anglicans. They have to work with the, they have to work all the, all these people and even the Roman Catholics in order to achieve it because of the situation on the ground. All right. Well, um, I think I, I think I read a different book because in chapter eight on revolution, you actually make a case for how a minority of Christians can rule over a nation. Uh, my concern yeah. is, I mean, okay, so this is now I know this is just political philosophy, so I shouldn't take it that seriously. Apparently, I don't think a lot of people understand that. Well, I why wouldn't you take political philosophy seriously? <laughs> well, you don't I, seem to take this seriously. It seems to be well, highly relativized, and there's a lot I, of situational I a, ethics here. I write a long book, and I have a page where I discuss what a, a question I thought that was interesting. If you notice that, that's near kind of the end of the chapter, I believe. And I thought to myself, you know, it'd be interesting to no, try to no, analyze it's, this it's, question. It's early in the here. chapter. I think. Oh, okay, okay. I I've got a screen cap. I could bring it up. But okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So, it, it, so, so I thought so, it was. I thought it was an interesting question that let's say that you did get to a, a place where a minority of Christians um, were cap were it, for given the circumstances were actually capable of ruling over the state. What? How? How would they be? Could they do that? And so I analyzed that. I, I didn't prescribe it for America. Again, it's political theory. I don't talk about America until chapter ten. I think it's an interesting question. People freak out, but they don't actually, they don't actually refute the argument. It's an argument. I give the question. I, I do the statement of the question. I give an argument, and the only argument against it is people freaking out about it and not understanding that it's just one small little piece of a much, much broader um, pr uh, political okay. theory. Right. And I, you, I, you know, it's just like it's good for Twitter, but it's not actually. Um, all right. well, if, if you don't point. like it, then refute the argument. I mean, Have you, you like been it, online it, lately? I mean, the, the, the sort of people that like your book and like your tweets and that come to what they call brigade people who disagree with you, uh, they're, in, they're some very unseemly characters. And I wonder how they're going to read your chapter. I mean, this, this is brought back to the pastoral thing. When we've got transing of kids and when we've got, uh, you know, a leader like, like uh, Donald Trump that might incite some people and a leader like bit biden who you know pretty much ought you know is is, in, is inciting uh rage against him rightfully so uh i i don't think it's a responsible um i don't think it's responsible some of this i don't think it's helpful and i i, I try to imagine how other people read things and i don't think it's helpful i mean and i, I bet if the if the people on twitter are reading your book i worry about the implications of what they're going to do well, I, I want to say something. I've been quiet, and so it's time for me to talk. Um, two things. One, this sounds like a lot of hermeneutical and tribal shadow boxing. I don't think we're talking about anything we actually disagree with. Stephen and I would have substantial disagreements, but I find it interesting that we were able to read my book, or read my book. It's not my book. It's your book, Stephen. We were able to read your book at our parish and have substantial disagreement. And Stephen knows friends of mine who I probably disagreed with. Um, but I, we were able to disagree and then go on about our day. And I think the particular problem is two things. One, when the Episcopal Church changed over from the Church of England to the Episcopal Church, one of the things the bishop said was this. It is not our job to speak to whether the constitutional settlement was was. Um, rightly settled. So the bishop said, we're not going to speak to that. And the Church of England sort of said, okay, that's fine. I, I think that there's a lot of sort of, there, there, it, it, there's asking for a sort of biblicist um, codification of something that's that's not supposed to be codified. 
I don't know if Americans are supposed to figure this out. We're supposed to act prudentially. And I think that was the position of the Episcopal Church. I think it was the right one, by the way. Uh, two things. Uh, the Episcopal Church has always understood that countries and families and other things could be hallowed. Uh, the prayer book says they can be hallowed. Jesus, by his presence at, uh, at Bethany, hallowed the house of St. Martha and St. Mary. So I think uh, so much of this conversation seems like a, a disagreement between, um, I, I don't know, are people asking for sort of um, authoritarian de declarations where there aren't? And is that the problem? Uh, because I, I'm listening to this and thinking, this is all, uh, even where I disagree with Stephen, and we would disagree, um, I think, on some substantial things. I'm not sure why this is so intense of a debate. Like, like, what is it about two groups of Calvinists who you guys believe on 97% of the same stuff? Like, why is this so intense? Well, because we're, we're in America. So I'm, let me quote here. Yeah, but I'm, not, but I'm in America, and okay. what I explained to you was a bunch of Americans. Okay, well, you, you but you may not like you may like monarchy. I am not calling for a monarchical re I don't, regime. I don't, I don't care about monarchy. I'm okay. an American, and but my I, church I, is American. So what I'm you're quoting, doing now, what you're doing now, is you're presupposing that anything that's not a specific sectarian reading of a specific document is a departure from republicanism and liberalism. So what you're doing is sacralizing a specific moment. Now, I don't think this makes me support Stephen's position, but it's certainly not going to make me support this idea that I have to specifically say that this specific reading is what Jesus Christ prescribed for political theory. None of this should be sacralized. None of it. All right. Well, so let me read this quote. This is from Stephen's book. I envision a measured and theocratic Caesarism, the prince as a world shaker for our time. And before that, it says we don't have to have a monarchy in every civil polity, which means it's fine in some. That's, is that what we want? Is that what America, you know, again, this is pastoral. Do I, do I want my church people to be looking for the Christian prince who's a world shaker and a, we and to, for us to have a theocratic Caesar, that would affect the church. I mean, that has implications for the church, for its ministry, for its relation to people of other faiths, for um, for evangelism, for peace in a community. I'm in the wrong community, and I'm going to advocate for a theocratic Caesar in California. How's that going to work out? I don't think Stephen's asking for theocracy. Well, this, how this is, how else do we read this? I envision a measure of theocracy theocratic. Is ruled by the priests, so necessarily yeah. that's not the, theocracy. Yeah, this is this, 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 like but what it's, is the terms of this the disagreement? It's permissible, though, right? Isn't it permissible? Yes, there's a lot of stuff that's permissible. So right, but still, is it really, Miles? It's not as if I, I don't want to speak for Brad Chortles. Sorry, I don't know if I blow your cover there. Oh whatever, no, I have but, no cover. Uh, it's not as if. We're trying to make hallowed Republican liberal order. It could be that we're actually trying to say that the, that the American revisions and getting the magistrate out of the business of religion and getting the church out of the business of civil affairs was actually a good thing. And it took a long while for that it to work out. It doesn't do either one of those, Daryl. We already covered this. The, no, it, but no, but mean, no, it, no, it does. It still says that the magistrate why, is no, the nursing father of the church. What do you mean if, if, that it says make no, but sense. It, it does do it in the way that it. The civil magistrate is not involved in 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 church affairs or civil affairs the way Henry the Eighth was in 1534. The way the Stuarts were in in English and Stuart politics. It's not the Covenanters that were that we're doing here. And it took three centuries for Presbyterians to get over that kind of Constantinian uh, echo chamber. And what we You're still make me say Constantine is good again. No, but what we still haven't talked about is Stephen well, says uh, Stephen wonders if I think Christian nationalism is a good thing or not, or if it's possible. Where the heck in the Bible is Christian nationalism on offer, particularly in the New Testament? Now, if you want to go Old Testament, sure, go all theonomic if you want. 
But in the new class, all the reformers theonomic. You're going to see the all the reformers to the theonomists. That seems like a bad move. Wait, but but I'm saying that they weren't necessarily following Jesus and the apostles because of Constantine, and then. 13 centuries of Constantinianism, and you read the original Westminster Confession on the civil magistrate, and that is Constantine right there calling the council, sitting there, just like Constantine did at Nicaea in 325. And yeah, Jesus glorious. and the apostles, Jesus in his humanity and the apostles couldn't have ever conceived the Roman Empire becoming Christian. So there's a there's a, a great sermon by um, the second Episcopal bishop of um, Michigan who was very convinced disestablishmentarian liberal type, uh, and he said that um, Jesus's political philosophy is against the Herodians, which he defined as secularist, and it's against the, uh, the Sanhedrin, which he defined as theocracy. Uh, so, to the extent that Jesus does. I think Bishop Harris is on to something like to the extent that the Jesus is not winking when he says render unto Caesar. I think this is this is part of the thing. We have this idea that Jesus is kind of winking it's like render under Caesar, but not really. Caesar doesn't matter. I mean, at some point, I think we have to deal with the fact that that, that the, the church and the state actually interact. And what I think is there's a prudential prudential liberal interaction that happened really up until very recently. Uh, so I, that's where I would defend you, Daryl. I think you're right. Like, I think the American revisions are good. Like, I think this was good. This is a good settlement. This was good for society. Um, so I don't think I disagree with you. Uh, but I think wh what I don't want to do is I don't want to go this extra step and say that it's actually biblical. Right. But I, I I don't but, want to but Jesus was also against Peter. Peter took out the sword in John 18 and lopped off the guy's ear. He was probably a bad shot. Otherwise, he would have taken off his head. And Jesus would have had to put Malchus's head back together. And Jesus, what does he say? That's not the way my kingdom's coming. And what is the nation state? It has a monopoly on the legitimate use of force. And Jesus right there says, that's not the way it happens. But he is still, so I think this is, this is a, it's, we're, in, we're in Passion Tide. And so when, when we do the, the reading, um, you have this interaction between Pilate and Christ. And so when, when Pilate says, you know, are you king of the Jews? And Jesus basically says, this is as you say. Like, that's not Jesus winking. It's not like, yeah, I'm kind of, he is actually king. And so I think like we have to deal with that. That's a historical fact. Jesus was actually king of the Jews. But Miles, the point has to do with whether the church and the kingdom comes through force or through the proclamation of the word. That's what Jesus and the apostles understood. It took the apostles a long time to understand that because they thought it was going to be David's kingdom and there was going to be another uh, a monarch like that who would execute Christ, God's justice. That's not what Jesus was doing. And then three centuries later, Constantine comes, and then you can do the sword. But I think it's a very difficult situation for any Christian to say that the kingdom is advanced through force, through war, through police power. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, think, I don't think the proposition is that is, is to advance the church by force. I'm saying the kingdom. So I, I'm, how does so the, I'm not aware. The kingdom I, of I'm, Jesus Christ come. I mean, Daryl, Dar you're the historian here, but I, I'm not a, aware of any reformer who believed in executing heretics, uh, who believed that the kingdom of God was advanced um, by the sword. In fact, they believed the opposite. Um, they believed that it was um, it was achieved through proper proclamation of the world uh, of the word and through uh, <clears throat> through persuasion so that that's how directly the gospel and the kingdom is advanced nevertheless before we go to church i mean this is just basic stuff before we go to church we get a good night's rest we have a nice cup of coffee in the morning we have a nice hearty breakfast and why do we do that so that our body is prepared to uh, attend that service so that our soul can be fed and so there are earthly supports that occur that you do we all do, and I'm sure you encourage your congregation to do so that they can show up to worship with 
with a, a body that is not a hindrance to their soul in worship. Okay, so there is a relationship of temporal to spiritual, and we are all very willing and, in fact, think it's wise and prudent to order that to the higher good. And the same is going to be true within the earthly realm, even though it's not the food in your belly that's going to feed your soul. Nevertheless, it's an important ancillary condition or supporting condition for you to receive that. The same thing would be in society. The same thing is true with, with uh, the family. We order our families such that within the power that we're given by God, we're order, we order our families and, and family worship and all these other things that are not technically the church. And yet still they are something we, we do for the spiritual good of those people, the people of the family. Right. So it, like if, if I if I tell if I correct my child for saying something that's an error or well, let's say, I mean, God forbid, say someone has an older child and that older child is now, uh, you know, uh, heretical or f fell from the faith and is now trying to convince a younger child that uh, that the Bible is er erroneous and all this and that you would probably do something with your own parental power and say silence. Don't do that. And you're that's your power, your force, your earthly power being used to that end. So I would just say that if you're willing to do that, which I assume you would, you would, then there's nothing precluding in the civil realm doing exactly the same thing, not ordering people to believe, not commanding or punishing people simply for the false belief, but having an outward order, the ordering the body, the external world such that it conduces to spiritual good in the same way all these other reasons I showed. So, it's so not there really only, is no, so to separate only, temporal and spiritual is, is not, is first of all, we don't do it. So practically you're already violating the principle. And I'm saying that can be extended out to every sphere of life such that each sphere within it's the limits of its power mm -hmm. can be ordered to the spiritual, but it still cannot order it or command it or, or bring it directly. But the, the, the First Amendment to the Constitution makes provision for freedom of speech, which means bad speech as well as good speech. Now, if you want to follow Roman Catholics, who up until 19, Vatican II said error has no rights, and therefore erroneous views should not be expressed because they can hurt the souls of people and lead them astray, okay, you can go there, but that's not the American founding. That's not Thomas Jefferson. That's not James Madison. Now I know they're not John Knox. They're not John Calvin. Oh my no! Oh my Allah! They don't even oh represent Allah. the majority of the, of the founding oh, either, Daryl. Oh, but they, I mean, I think, no, no, no. That's if you're going to go against free speech, go ahead. No, no. But, no, but again, my, okay, my point is, free, free speech has always had limitations, right? And it, there was at the founding obscenity laws and blasphemy laws, and they were considered completely congruent with the provisions of the First Amendment. So the point is there's always limitations on these things. Not and in, I don't, not I don't think that's Gress, enough. Not in Jay Gresham Machen's world. Well, now you're jumping was, to Machen. He wasn't a founder last I checked. So right. I, I, but, 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 but you're, you guys are in Day Park churches, and you don't seem to actually know something about the way that Presbyterianism has evolved over the 20th century. But right. you do like to make, make, make us look stupid who like appreciate Machen and don't appreciate Calvin and Knox the way we should, or Winthrop and, and the, the prosecution. Well, Winthrop was better there. than Machen, that's for but, sure. But but, but, the, but, but, Cal, but Machen believed in free speech for communists, Roman Catholics, and a host of people like that. Why? But I'm, I'm, I mean, this is probably, oh, we're, all, you, we're all over you, the place, so I don't understand what the, what we're actually talking about. At this right, point. Because we're, we're talking about the American that founding. Uh, invoked. Yeah, but that, that has nothing to do with the US We're talking about the American founding we're and the revisions of the West, that. Westminster Confession and, uh, and that was in light well, of that. My next question. Right, but, I, but I'm assuming we have to hold to the Constitution Sorry, a failed document? Many people say that online now. Is the First Amendment um, untenable, ungodly, obsolete? You, this is, you guys are shadow boxing. Like, like, like none, you're not talking. To, no, 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 let's, no, no let's, that's an issue. That people care about this issue. Are we going to have the First Amendment or not? That no one's talking about the First Amendment. No, it's all no. Uh, so, if no, you can here's, punish here's, heresy and speech, let's, let's, we're talking about the First Miles, Amendment. Stephen just mentioned how you do things for the body to protect the soul. Yeah, but that, we all that has implication for the First Amendment. Yeah, but we do that. So we regulate racist speech. Like, like, so, 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 what? What's the proposition then? So what Wait. we're doing, what we're doing 
is we're actually asking. But some of us object to regulating reg racist speech, that that seems to be a violation of the First Amendment. Yeah, I mean, so, so I don't. I don't know if if we're arguing. Are we over arguing over a principle N like nothing? Because I don't know if anybody believes that there's no regulation on this. I just I don't know how that's, a, that's an ontological possibility. So at some level, everybody believes there's some sort of limit. And so what we're what we're debating is the degree to which our philosophy of history informs where we can kind of set this limit. Like no, no one believes in completely free speech. No one does. And so okay. it sounds so like what the debate is, is where where is the appropriate limit and to what degree is there religious influence on that limit? Will well, we the, the, will first we amendment, able to the First Amendment is also about religious freedom. And that is, that's all over so, uh, so these discussions. I, a wonderful book by Carl Esbeck and Jonathan Den Hartog uh, is, is, is about disestablishment. I have a chapter in that book, Carl Esbeck and Jonathan Den Hartog are, neither of them are Christian nationalists. Um, but, you know, one of the things, points they make is that the current application of the First Amendment is a mid 20th century creation. And it's probably a good mid 20th century creation. But the First Amendment, as it's read in 1789, uh, is, is, isn't the one we have today. And that's probably not something I like. I like the First Amendment. How, it, how it's rendered today largely. Uh, I like a pretty libertarian, you know, take on free speech, but I don't want to Bible my particular, uh, my particular reading of it. And I think that's, that's the thing. It's, it's, it's like, to what degree are each of us kind of asking for, uh, for the other point to be sacralized? Right. No, it's not about a sacralizing. It's a matter of people attacking. There's a lot of post liberalism out there, and I and I see Stephen in that category. I see Timon, an American reformer, as post liberal. I also see the the in integralist as post liberal. I see uh, uh, Peter Lightheart and James uh, Wood as post liberal, and I see the Scottish National Party, which is about to pass. Uh, an amazing hate speech law as post-liberal. So to act like this is not really a big deal or, or we're talking past or shadow boxing is actually not true, Miles. I think this is a serious issue. Free speech is under attack a lot of the places. And I think Stephen Wolf's book could be used to support suppression of free speech, which could which could penalize a lot of bad stuff that I don't like, but it could also penalize a lot of Christian stuff, which is happening. So is, but the question is, okay, so maybe that's the case for Stephen's book. I've only read parts of it. Um, but is that not the case for, uh, so, so is that not the case for anything else? What, what does that mean? I mean, so, so it means is, is that I think there's, that we are pretty comfortable with our speech being regulated all the time through subnational institutions, through non-state institutions. And what so, would be, what would be an example of that? Uh, I mean, I mean, our our ac access to telemedia is a good example of it, right? That's actually a regulation. It's a it's 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 a pri it's a privatized one, but this is actual regulation. I think the problem is we're we're, we're continually making the state. A synonym for government. There's plenty of government in us in our lives all the time. Not all of it's done by the state. So to the degree that which speech is regulated, I'm not. So this is, let me put it this way. I'm not sure whatever disagreements I might have with Stephen's book are the most worrisome potential influences for the regulation of speech in life in 2024. Well, I would put it this way. I I think freedom of speech is under assault. And I don't want to see Christians assaulting freedom of speech. And I think the Christian nationalists are doing that. All right. Well, so this is, you know, the first table. The first table of the law is, is something that in this, I'm learning that this is just sort of theoretical stuff. It, it probably won't happen. It's not a big deal. God, the creator, has obligated civil rulers to enforce the first table of the moral law. And so they must concern themselves with religion, even revealed religion, 
The second commandment permits the prince to suppress false religion and to establish true religion according to divine precepts of ceremonial worship. That's the other part of the First Amendment. That's the freedom of religion. Uh, it's there. Maybe maybe this is what people want, but I don't see how this is not in uh, contrary to the the American settlement, to what we believe about freedom of religion and protects the protections of the First Amendment, which, if we dispose of, could be used against us. I mean, Stephen, this is a book review, so I guess that's to you. Uh, since we're, we're just covering, I guess the book. I have well, to respond to that. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I yeah, wanted I, to be I, I wanted to be fair. I mean, this is what you wrote. Now you okay. can explain it to me, but I'm yeah. not making it up. Yeah, but this was important. Yeah, um, yeah. The the second commandment permits prince to suppress false religion. Yeah, that's too. So I, I use the word permits. I think that's absolutely the case, uh, and to establish religion according to ceremonial worship. So they they absolutely if they um, they, they can yeah like they can establish worship. But again, that's according to this is describing the powers, uh, in principle of what a Christian civil ruler um, can do. Like I've already explained, but you don't want them to do it. No, I, I, I want them to do it uh, as best they can according to the circumstances on the ground. So, like, I mean, for example, uh, I just, I don't, I don't know if this will open another can of worms, but like what? Uh, so, what John Witherspoon, everyone here loves him, I guess. Uh, he uh, in the lectures of moral philosophy, he says this: he has the magistrate. Or the ruling part of any society ought to encourage piety by his own example and by endeavoring to make it an object of public esteem. Whenever the general opinion is in favor of anything, it will have many followers. Magistrates may promote and encourage men of piety and virtue, and they may, may discountenance those whom it would be improper to punish. So he's in that the American late 18th century context, specifically saying that the civil rulers should promote and encourage piety and to discountenance those that they cannot, it would be improper to punish. So that's that's essentially what I'm saying. Well, and th that's something that, in general, they should do. And you know, within suppress the suppress false religion and there, establish true religion. Establish true religion. Yeah, they're what permitted. In, they're permitted to do that. Yes. What right, but, what what in all of history or personal experience leads you to believe that this would work out well? <laughs> And, and I have to I have to run through the the history. I, this is an argument of what's permissible. Um, I think that cr the I, I mean, are we going to get like jump through? I mean, this is what happens is I'm going to say it was good then, it was bad then. I mean, it, it's good and bad throughout all of history. So I mean, at times it's good, at times it goes poorly, just like any policy. I mean, it, it's one of those things. Like if you want to play the game of like. Uh, if, if something goes bad, therefore we shouldn't ever enact it. I mean, we can go through the list of democracy. In most cases, if you do a case study or just list up the cases of democracies in the world, most of them fail and end up in tyranny. And so, oh, democracy is bad then. I mean, so if we're going to follow this principle to its conclusion um, on other cases, then we have to throw out a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, just take well, liberal I, I democracy. I do think democracy but, is bad. That's, yeah. that's a bad example, Stephen. Oh, yeah, I, well, I, yeah, I'm saying it's a, yeah, yeah, pick it yeah, pick according to the aristocracy. Right? But the same thing with liberal democracy. I mean, look at you turn on the television. I think I'm pretty sure liberalism has, uh, unless we're desensitized, I'm pretty sure it's failed. So therefore, we should throw out liberalism. I mean, again, like if people they think yeah. this is a good argument, but Steven, it's, it's, relying, it's relying on a it's relying on a principle that if universally applied means that you have to throw out basically everything. I mean, marriages fail. Let's throw out marriage. I mean, just you can go down the line, and it's just a, not a good argument. It relies on a faulty, erroneous premise. Um, and uh, anyway, I think Miles is someone. Yeah, say I, that. I just I want to. So I think this is maybe where you and I would well, I would disagree, and I think it's a good faith disagreement. I, I'm I would define myself as a liberal, um, largely because I think when I think of liberalism, I think of, of historical development. I think I'm Anglican, so maybe I can admit to believing in, in development a little bit more easily. So I think of like a tradition downstream from Lincoln and a Lincolnian tradition. I, I I'm not sure liberalism. Well, if we mean failed, do we mean it's it's no longer doing its job? Um, I, I would agree with you there, perhaps, but I don't think that that's because lib liberalism wasn't doing its job. I think liberalism got killed. 
So I think I would be willing to defend uh, like the, like a mid 20th century, like like a 1950 liberal settlement. If that's if that's considered liberal, I think I would say that liberalism actually works. Like I, I think I think it works. Like I think that liberal freedom is probably a good thing. I think maybe where I would stake my claim is I'm not sure what we're doing in 2024 is liberal. Um, I would I would I would say maybe we are actually post liberal and we are trying to figure out what to do now that we're we're post liberal. Um, but I, I think the I think the liberal I think the, the principles of liberalism, uh, I don't know if they failed. I think they were killed. Um, but so that's maybe if we wanted to have like a, a specific disagreement um, between us. Uh, I don't know. We've got to have something to fight about just so we can throw red meat to, to, the, to the people. But uh, I, I think liberalism, I think liberalism works. Like I, I think that when I think of liberalism, I think of Henry Clay, Abraham Lincoln, Lord McCallie, right down to something like uh, someone like uh, Daniel Moynihan, you know, a, a figure in the seven. You can maybe take it to Reagan or even to, to George W. I don't like George W. Bush that much, but I don't I don't see the society that George W. Bush is running as monstrous and in need of and in need of of revolution um so i think that's where i would say the biggest tension point is is my concern isn't that i think you know everything's going great i think what i would say is i think i have a my tolerance is is for for what was a liberal society is such that i don't think it needs to be overturned um now where i can't go is i i don't think that i'm able as a christian to say there could never be X, like because because history still happens. So I, I think you're 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 on to something. But I think that what, what what the debate is is like where where are we in history? I think this is a debate over philosophy of history to a large degree, and I think that's maybe we where, where a lot of the 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 the, the, the disagreements are. Um, I, I'm I'm willing to defend liberalism. I, I think it's I think it's good. But back to the, qu the quotation that you read, Stephen, from Witherspoon, when he says the magistrate <laughs> should promote piety. Mm -hmm. Well, which piety? Protestant? Yes. Roman Catholic? Protestant. Jew Jewish? Protestant. But, but, if, but, if you, but if you have <laughs> Roman Catholics and Jews in your society, you can't do that. Explicitly. Why? They should not be promoted, yes. Why not? Why not? Yeah. Because they're paying money. They're paying taxes. They're part of this community as well. That's part of what the American founding was trying to do, was to try to be a, a nation that wasn't based on a particular tribal group, whether religious, ethnic, or some other arrangement. Well, so that, it was, it true. was, <laughs> that's not, what true. do you mean? It's not true. Yeah. Yeah. There was a deep, there was a deep understanding among the founders that they were Anglo Protestant. That, that's why Benjamin Franklin didn't like the Germans. It's why there were so many issues that they they. Is that sought. why George Washington never took communion? That they well, were deeply I mean, was, Anglo Protestant. I mean, they were. They were I mean, you, you yourself, many, you yourself, in, in your book on on your book on the spiritual bi biography of ben, Benjamin Franklin, said that right. he was culturally Protestant. Right. I remember that because I underlined it and said, "Oh, that's a good one." Um, and so right. I think and that, that, that the cultural rest of Protestantism, as well. that cultural Protestantism made room for Jews and Roman Catholics before yeah, British society did. did. It, it did, but it, it so did then, that precisely because there was a confident, there was a so confident what kind of piety, what kind of piety did the magistrates promote when Jews and Roman Catholics were su sufficient, uh, force or or demographic in their under their charge they had to change that so you know if you want to yeah. okay. if you want to go back and, de and debate immigration policy and the movement of peoples and try to get back to a majority protestant society you know that's something certainly worth you know I, there's all sorts of rooms to debate america's immigration policy right now but you know that's not where it is, nor is it where America was in the 19th century. But it is where Geneva was. It is where Britain was. It is where Massachusetts was, where they they policed the borders of their territories and kept out the wrong kind. Yeah. Do we want to go back to that? But I don't think that's the proposition. Well, uh, okay. That's what that's what I'm, I'm reading in the book that 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 ethnicity is very important, 
and that privileging the Christian religion over all others is 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 the goal. Um, how do we get there? Well, uh, why isn't I, it the proposition, Miles? Well, because I mean, the the as as I've understand Stephen's book, um, he's he's basically asking to get away. I think the Stephen, you can correct me if I'm wrong. The 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 essential, I think, failing that Stephen has identified, what he sees as a failing, is a constant universe, like uni universalization of everything. And so he's sort of trying to reach, reclaim something particular, because particular that which is particular is that which is most likely to be embodied, and that's actually so how you will how you will kind of or eventually order society. You can't order society on universals. Um, is that fair, Stephen? Yeah, I, I mean, you. Yes, yeah, that's good enough. <laughs> no, um, I I, pre, I appreciate that. Yeah, that is that is that is pretty much it. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's what I read in your book, and I think that's you know we read it in my parish, and Stephen, you know some of the, the people in in my parish, and so that's I think that's kind of what broad acceptance of a ma the major theme was, and so I think the the reason why. Um, but isn't Christianity use universal? Yeah, but politics aren't universal. Right, but but still, if you're trying to use Christianity for a nation, then the nation is going to become universal. Well, so I think I think it, the no, way all universals have to be particularized in their expression. I mean, that's that's just. I mean, even the the things we see in the in the English liberties that the the British liberties that are being appealed to at the founding, these are particularizations of things that may have a universal form. Uh, but the exact way they're expressed and expected by the the continentals at that point um, are, are, you know, according to time and, and history and tradition and, and expectations. So all things have to be particularized in order for them to have any kind of teeth uh, to be defended or asserted whatsoever. So I, th I think which that's is, all Miles is saying. Even which though, is why but, Christianity, when it's particularized, is particularized in the church and not in the state. Because Christianity, trans, Christianity is knows no tribe. You go to Pentecost, and there are all those different groups there. Jude, yeah, and they he, still spoke to them in their languages. So. Israel was a nation. It was a particular tribe. It was it was yes. bound by blood, land, and religion. Christianity blew That's that up. That's why the confession says their particular laws have expired with that polity, but that doesn't mean that those that. But Christianity particular. transcends that arrangement, and it also transcends politics. Well, That's why Jesus but, in in John eighteen is so important. That's not the way this kingdom's going to operate. Not through the sword, the way it did when David was going and killing the Philistines. So. so I think the question is, does Christianity annihilate um, human difference? So it, do I become anything less than, um, so, th th so I think in some ways Anglicans move towards Stephen's position on this because the Anglican proposition is that actually Christianity subordinates all nations to itself. It doesn't annihilate nations, all nations submit to, to Christianity. That's, that's, the, that's the proposition. That's why the Anglican communion works the way it does, by the way. That's why we we have we retain the form of national churches. Um, so the question is, do I somehow become anything other than uh, me who was born in North Carolina in 1980 in the Christmas of 1983? Like, does Christianity and does the, the does the kingdom coming annihilate that? No, because there are two kingdoms. Okay, but but um, there's the, there's the kingdom of redemption and there's the kingdom of creation. And yeah, but it's, it's, within it's, the created order, there are all sorts of diversities. Yeah, but is my body redeemed, or is it just my soul? Sure, your body's redeemed. Okay, but that so, doesn't mean that doesn't mean the nation's redeemed. No, well, it, so so can can I, I think so? The question is, can a family be redeemed? Yeah, and okay, a church so, can be redeemed. But where do you get that a nation is redeemed from the New Testament? Well, I think, I mean, the... The, the nation itself is a, a, a late medieval, early modern notion. Well, it's but, not something that, that Romans or the early Christians knew what a nation was, a nation state, especially the way we, we, we think about it. 
Well, but so when it says, so what is the, what does the scripture mean when every tongue, every tribe, every nation, like, like what, what is being constructed there? It means well, it, it recognizes the existence of nations, but I, I agree with Daryl. There's nothing that, that requires or extols or prioritizes. And I think that's the problem with Christian nationalism. It prioritizes the nation. When the yeah. church is the thing, the church is the thing. So let, let me right. let me well, read from well, he, can I, can he, I Hebrews. Go, just a minute, can I, Hebrews thirteen, th two verses. Back to the the abrogating uh, the Jewish nation. So let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come, not the nation that is to come, not the nations that are to come. Uh, this. There is an otherworldly focus with with, yep. with and people don't like that. We, we, yeah, so I think uh, I mean in, in the book I man I say this so many times in the book. The one thing I do repeat over and over and over in the book is that I'm not trying to bring heaven down to earth. I'm not immunitizing the eschaton. I'm not trying to make uh, turn temporal life into spiritualized life. I say over and over and over that you order the temporal, you order the temporal to the eternal. You order. The civil to the you know spiritual, you order the I don't know the earthly to the heavenly. I say this over and over and over because yes, the Christian life is this sort of pilgrimage to a higher celestial city. But uh, what comes with that is are the temporal supports uh, to aid you in that in that um, on that that pilgrimage. And so just like the family, like if you guys want to say that only the church is this thing that we call uh you know a colony of heaven or whatever you want to call it then you're excluding the family from that that means you can't have christian families if you can't have christian families or if you can't have a christian nation it's likely you can't have a christian family so then something went wrong a christian nation is simply a nation that arranges itself such that it it encourages people to transcend the nation in other words to look to the, the heavenly nation, the heavenly Jerusalem. And so that's that's all I'm saying. If you guys treat me as like a post-millennialist or um, reconstruct, whatever it is, then yeah, that would be false. That's not what I... I, I, no I actually one, don't think... I don't think... I, I think the gospel is a lot less political than you think, than you might realize. I think the gospel is mainly about eternal life. I think then that politics recognizes the means to salvation, the means to... Uh, uh, achieve you know or attain eternal life and then it orders people uh, given its powers to that just like the powers of the family and your own individual power as an individual you do the same thing uh, right, so, so we're, and that, we're that's at... it and the problem is i think a lot of you you guys I, you guys uh, i don't mean this i think you guys have been de it, within battles the battles you guys have faced have been largely against neo-calvinist kyperians um you know like uh whatever the, the other guys the post mill and theonomy reconstructionists but I, i'm not i'm not that uh, i'm actually somewhat on your side when it comes to two kingdom theology but um, your publisher just, is is on that side yeah they, they <laughs> are on that side yeah um which i'm very grateful that they would uh give me a platform yeah, to, but to give i mean side. that's um, why, we, why that's nice why me, so. that's why we, i tweeted at you when the book came out that was maybe not the best choice to be published with them no, they they've been great. Um, actually, no, it's, I, I don't I, think I, I don't think that's choice. so great. They would have. <laughs> they let me put the dad bod thing in there, so uh, right, I'm so, grateful. So um, you, you said but, something important. You said that politics are supposed to help help us in our spiritual journey, basically. Yeah, just like a good a good a stomach full of food helps okay, you. Okay, but uh, pay where attention where in the Sunday, New Testament yeah. do I find this? Where do I find this in the New Testament? See, if uh, you're well, a, if you're a churchman, yeah. if you're a church officer. You've got to, the pastoral epistles are very important. All the New Testament's important. How you order the church and how you minister to people is is what it's all about. I don't see this in the New Testament. I don't see any warrant for it, so I can't recommend it or re certainly require it of of our people. Yeah, but... but, but well, Brad, I don't want... No, no I, won't, I want Stephen to answer. Where yeah, but this, this is, is in the New this Testament? This is a slightly different... I mean, I have a slightly different take... Not different take. I agree with Stephen. Um, a slightly different way of looking at it is that, you know, what is what is politics? Politics is a... Wait, wait, wait. Time uh, and, Go back to the question that Brad is asking about where is this in the New Testament? I'm going to get to it, Daryl, if you... Oh, okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm All right. About. Okay. So politics, it, you know, it is a matter of justice. That's what the the... You know, governing authority is supposed to pursue. 
um, you know, punishing evil, rewarding good, Romans 13. And so then the question becomes, as a matter of justice, what is what is a good and ordered polity look like? It's not about eminentizing the eschaton, as Stephen said. Um, it's not about bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. It's about what is what is the duty required here of a good magistrate in pursuing good things for his people and promoting the good and punishing evil. And if we don't include in the good their spiritual goods, as Richard Hooker would say, you're just governing hogs, you're governing animals, and, and which means you can't govern them according to law, because that's a requiring of a reasonable person. Um, and a reasonable person also has a soul, and they have those heavenly goods as well uh, awaiting them that you want to promote them to. This is not taking away the keys of the kingdom, but they are external helps, uh, you know, to promote those things, just like in a way, just like church discipline is, right? This is an external help, hopefully promoting uh, but the person back. Simon, you didn't answer the question. You went to Romans 13 and talked about the description of the, the emperor there, but you didn't say where Paul yeah. and others were looking to the magistrate for help in in the coming of the king. Oh, okay. So they weren't I'm looking saying, to the, because they were they were having to worry about whether they were going to get right. That's, that's by not the, an ideal situation, obviously. Right. So they so so yeah. so, so again, so, that's that's a reason why it's not there in the New Testament. It doesn't not, come I'm, until I'm not, Constantine converts. Well, let's let, let's just no, let's back up here. So so if true. it's I'm, uh, I'm describing the I'm describing the role of the good magistrate. I'm saying this is part of his role. And yeah, that but, doesn't... but Paul in, in Romans 13 is talking about Nero to honor that emperor. Right. To, to honor him, you have to honor, you know, God given authority. I'm saying Romans 13 is also telling you what the good authority does. And as a matter right. of. And you, and you might think, some might think that you guys would say, well, maybe you don't honor the liberal political order of the American founding because it's got all these flaws. But then Paul says, honor Nero, who's a, who's a nut job. Yeah, the, I mean, those are those are not the same thing to critique a, a particular political order. It's not the same as dishonoring the one who is given authority by God. Uh, so and our, those aren't the same thing. Uh, my only point is that th this is if you're going to get into, as you know, reform political theorists have, what the good is and what the subjects are, meaning the, the men you're governing, you have to be considerate of their, their spiritual well-being as well. And you have to promote that. That doesn't mean everywhere alike can you promote that in the same way. I mean, this is why, you know, Aquinas and others would say you can't you can't you're not going to be able to abolish every sin, including brothels is, is the example used. Um, because if, under prudential judgment in this situation, it's it's going to lead to you know too much chaos and, and disruption. So you can't pursue it now. So, um, but, so, but it doesn't mean that you think brothels are good. Or but, but, so political theory is. tells the church that the magistrate could be useful in doing this, but the New Testament doesn't tell the church this. No, I'm I'm literally talking Why? about Romans 13. So. Uh, no, no, you're not literally talking about. You're talking about a lot of political theory because Paul doesn't say, "Oh, by the yeah, way, this the, emperor, the emperor is going to the, the emperor is going to help us out here." He doesn't say. I that. mean, I do think you have to come to the text. You know, the scripture doesn't tell you the nature of a mountain or what it is, but it, it, it is able to reference them. And I mean, this is part of why yeah, natural yeah. principles and understanding are required uh, to be able to even make sense of the, of the text. It assumes them. Um, so. I, Expanding right, upon and you, and the, you, if you the read is the Acts, New Testament, the New Testament, it, it, it's principally about uh, it's Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world and the means to eternal life. I'd say that's the principal message of the uh, the New Testament, and that is actually crucial for the civil magistrate, and it, uh, in, in that he knows how to apply his. Uh, um, his duty to order the people to true religion. So it actually does instruct the civil magistrate in the New Testament. It does, it, it we're not Mars, you know, Marcionites. So we, we affirm that the New Testament assumes the moral law. We assume, we, we affirm that it assume, assumes duties of father and assumes duties of civil magistrate, assumes duties of, of people uh, and equals and superiors equals, right? So the New Testament doesn't actually have to explicitly say civil magistrates must promote and protect true religion. Um, in fact, New Testament's actually giving the magistrate exactly what sort of religion he's supposed to be protecting and fulfill his actual role um, as a as a minister of God for the good of the people under him. 
Uh, so right, but the New Testament is also teaching you what the, what it's like to live under the Roman Empire as a Christian. And, and the story mm -hmm. of Acts and the story of Paul and the way he, he gets tried and eventually has to go to Rome and is eventually executed. That's not the lesson that I think a lot of Christians want to take away from, oh, this is how to do politics. No, well, I think, well, I think because, I mean, John Cotton does the, deals with this quite well in the text where he says, you know, if you find yourself in the first century context, uh, which is not ideal, again, it's not preferable. Um, yeah, I mean, th th there's your kind of roadmap of how to endure that persecution. But if you were, as in the case of Massachusetts, given as, mm. as Christians a place to establish a government and society, uh, what should you do? Should you invite, uh, you know, the, those Maybe. conditions of the first century to yourself because this is the only just way to live? Or should you order yourself as a Christian people because it's justice to God and justice to man and it's for everyone's good? And if you're going to order yourself, maybe you don't use the uh, the model of the of the Roman Empire and persecute Christians or other religious groups. Sorry, I'm talking about persecution. I'm not talking about persecution. But I'm talking about Massachusetts, which did persecute. Oh, <laughs> it depends. It depends on how you understand persecution. Well, I think uh, Roger but, Williams was a Baptist in good standing and he was not exactly welcome and again quakers and yeah Luther, i mean quakers were Roger killed Williams is a strange quakers example were to use because no, but Roger quakers Williams were executed. Is kind of nuts yeah i mean i mean quakers were executed after they were banished multiple times and asked to stay away because they and when they got up on the scaffolding were asked again if they would promise to stay away because this is how we're doing things here rhode island is available they said no um and so of course they executed them because it's the 17th century it's more brutal than many of us could probably handle at this point because we're soft liberals oh but okay the, the, all right the, so if you have a daughter the one point day, is, if you have so, a daughter don't transport your don't time machine travel back to massachusetts because if she says or does the wrong thing she may be drugged behind a wagon naked for two or three days no, that that's, I mean, that's not, you're caricaturing the, the, no, I'm not, I, I, I've, I've, I've read, the, I've read yeah. the, the book Albion Seed, a careful yeah. work of cultural history, it mm -hmm. just, the, the four migrations in the U.S. And if you want to go back to Massachusetts, you go, yeah, it's, I don't think we a, want to do that. It's not as simple as doing or saying the wrong thing. I mean, there's right. plenty of examples where you have open, uh, open dissenters within a congregation. It will tell, take them over a decade to kind of deal with the situation because they're trying to be pastoral and bring them along and encourage them, uh, you know, to, to, yeah, conform to true doctrine, of course. Um, but, but this doesn't mean any of those things were wrong in principle. And Roger Williams is just a strange example to cite considering how absolutely nuts he was. I mean, he was smart, but very crazy and disruptive, intentionally so, as the Quakers were also. Uh, you know, Quakers are not the guys on, on the oats box today. They're, they're very different in the 17th century. But time, um, you know, some people think so, you're, you're crazy. And in a post-liberal environment, they might come for you. Well, well that's, that's totally fine for them to think I'm crazy. I'm just saying Roger Williams is not a great, I mean, he's not even really a Baptist, right? He but his but that's just why understand. the American yeah. founding is a good thing, because it makes room for crazy people like you and me. Yeah, there, there's, I mean, dissenters and crazy people like us are just a fact of any, you know, society. They're always, always present. Can, can uh, I ask why, why are we, why are, why are we comparing Puritan, 17th century Puritan Massachusetts to the 21st century? Shouldn't we be actually asking about 20, 21st, or shouldn't we actually be asking about 17th century Massachusetts across the 17th century? Yeah, like, I think so, which was, which was considered... Uh, of course, very tolerant in, right. in comparison, right? So, so, so uh, I, I don't like. Yeah. I, I guess I'm not understanding the what the the, the century jumping. Like, well, like we got people that want to go there. I don't think that's the case. Um, oh, no, okay. I I, th I think that people here's what people want. People just don't want crazy stuff in public schools. That's really what people want. And as long as people, this is part of the problem. If you look at parents and say to them, um, you know, you need to just 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 suck it up and live with what's going on in public schools. They're going to find anybody who will 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 offer them something of a constructive alternative. And I think this is the weakness of saying of, of, of retreating to sort of a, a pure what I'll call the pure spirituality of the church thing. 
Because what you do is you tell parents, well, you know, you, you can't actually ask this question. And there's sort of a natural duty that parents will say, look, I don't care what the church says. Like, I have a natural duty to protect my kids. So people don't want to go back to the 17th century. They want some Christian to actually say, hey, isn't there a way that the church actually has something to say to what's going on in our moment? I think that I don't think that people actually want that. They feel that most people aren't educated. Right. So they're just looking for any. They're just throwing the mud at the wall and sort of saying, somebody tell me something to help me out. But and why so, does it have to be the church, Miles? In well, a society like ours, we have all sorts of public representatives. We have lawyers. We have all sorts of other people. Why does the church have to do it? Well, because uh, the, the, the church is, is a fount of truth. Right. Like like the church can speak that something that's true. Now, what 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 I would propose is I don't actually think the church needs to do this. Right. So so this is actually what I don't believe. I think that religion needs to do this, but not the church. So I'm willing to make a distinction between the church and religion because I'm not Catholic. Right. I don't think that the church is synonymous with with religion. So I think that I would love to hear Christian doctors and Christian uh, professors and Christian philosophers talk about this. But people what about been, but what about the Jewish people who talk about it? What about the Roman Catholic people talk about it? What about the agnostics? There are lots of people beyond Christians that are concerned about what's going on in schools. And I think if you look to Christians, Christian princes, etc., you're actually going really tribal and again in a very pluralistic society when there are a lot more voices that actually could be useful okay, okay. for people so, making, okay. making I, don't dis I don't disagree with you but i think the question is where are those voices so 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 you think mm -hmm. of like i can think of like maybe three or four atheist uh intellectuals who are mm -hmm. right coded in such a way that they would affirm kind of what i'm going to use the word traditional i don't like the word traditional but who would affirm sort of like uh, you know uh, a historical understanding of how the family works i maybe they're out there i just don't know where they are. And so I think that a lot of people, like if you, you say, okay, we'll go look for an atheist to say this, people will probably be like, well, I don't know what, what atheist am I supposed to look to, to tell me how to, how to live. This is why when, when Francis Schaeffer writes, James Lindsay, he's not a big fan of Stephen's book, but James Lindsay is an atheist. He's pretty, pretty good on this stuff. Uh, well, but I mean, James Lindsay can tell me how the government's supposed to stay out of these conversations but james Lindsay can't tell me actually very well sort of how do i how do i raise my kids and how do i raise my kids to be christians in this world and so it's it's sort of a question of the church do we want the church to be the only source of truth if so the church is going to have to talk about things or if we want the church to actually not have to do this stuff shouldn't we have christians in other fields who can speak authoritatively about it that's that's just it. it's it's not asking for I don't think it's asking for theocracy, right? No, I, but, I, I, but I, I, don't, I don't think most people want that. I think people think they want that now because they've been told that the liberal order actually can't deal with this. And until we we got to stop telling people the liberal order can't deal with it. So that's my proposition. Well, a problem I have, I mean, you know, apparently I've read the book wrong, but I put in a lot of hours reading and listening to Stephen's book. And the, the question arose in my mind, how many of our allies, if, if, if our uh, Jewish or even Muslim moral allies or maybe the, uh, the unicorn atheist who gets some of it, if they read Stephen's book, um, they're going to think, I don't want to work with these people. Uh, they, wanna, they want a prince who can put me in jail for what I believe and what I'm doing. When in the cultural sphere, we do need those allies. I mean, you, you don't want to give it. You don't want to give up the the shop like we might have with evangelicals and Catholics together. But there is a place for co belligerents and allies. And as a Christian, I read Stephen's book and I think, how in the world is are are non Christians going to read this? Um, I, I just don't know. I mean, we we need allies. I mean, the world. Uh, the world sucks, and the world is screwed up. 
But we can adopt a strategy that sucks and is screwed up too and does more harm than good. And I think we're in danger. You you read it. So I did not read it and think what will non-Christians believe about it? I I, I just, I didn't like, I didn't care. I didn't didn't actually care what Presbyterians would think. We were talking about her. I'm going to go Baptist. Do you not care about the lost miles? Come on now. You got to care about the lost. No, but I, I, I like I care about what Jesus will do for them, but I'm not sure I care about right the the immediate relationship of a political philosophy work. Uh, like like I don't like so I don't read so I have uh, on my phone tonight I'm reading a series of sermons by Robert Murray McChain, right? And then on the other thing I'm reading is is a work of political theology by an Anglican bishop in New Hampshire in the 1830s. I don't read that and reflexively ask. What would a non-believer think about what this bishop says? Why? Because I'm not assuming a sort of universality of it. I'm assuming that it's being written particularly to me as an Anglican or as someone who will re- who will receive that. And so I, I think whatever I might disagree with Stephen on, I didn't think he was writing this to have a conversation with Jews or Catholic or whoever. I mean, it's it was. But, but Miles, the word nation is about and. Unless you're 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 talking about some theoretical Christian nation that C.S. Lewis is writing, you know, tales about, you're talking about a group of people. There are nations that are not merely Christian anymore. So, so I, you're talking about a wider, read, much wider I did, audience. I did read it as a theoretical, like because it's political theory. Yeah, but it's got the word Christian slap, slapped all over it. And it is it is twenty twenty three and twenty twenty four. And it, this is the world of natcons and Yaram Hazoni, and there's a lot of talk about nationalism going on out there, which is also part of what the book is has surfed on that wave. And and a lot of people are really worked up about Christian nationalism in ways that I think are really stupid, and there are lots of people who. Also think, yeah, this is this is the way to fix America. Yeah, and I would, I, Gerald, you've been, I think, I know in our private conversations, you're very measured. I, I don't think you're you're as sensationalist as, as most at all. I I don't I think I just don't I, I don't think I, I I responded to Stephen's work in the same way that maybe other people did. I mean, that if I could, Stephen, if I could speak honestly to you, and I think you'd appreciate. It. I I didn't love the last chapter. Right. I thought you were writing political philosophy and then you switched to red meat. So if I were to offer my own thing, like I, I just wish you would have left that. That was that was the hoity toitiness of me um, in there. But I didn't I didn't read this as merely. I was trying to be genre shattering. That's what I was. Among <laughs> I, other I, things. Yeah, I, I, just, I, I understand. I, I understand. Yeah, I, I, dr- I drank yeah, some I, I drank some vegetable oil, vegetable oil tonight in your honor. So, okay. okay. Thank you, you very should, much. You tweet that out. Be, yeah. And be sure and watch the uh, PCAGA live stream this year, and uh, you can you can rate my weight. You can you can rate my dad bod. Well, you have really that, good that, did, that did no, undermine no, no, your book. That would be rude. That'd be rude. Uh, that no. Well, but no. But you got online and said that PCA uh, elders at the General Assembly, based on your live stream viewing, were a bunch of fat asses, basically. And well, I didn't I say that. I, I mean, it, it is well, true I'm, that, I'm that there was, uh, there was, yeah, there was some of that. But um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, just a you know a friendly criticism. But um, but I think that uh, yeah, I, I th- so I, I I like what non Christians thought of the book. I don't know. His Yoram uh, Hazoni liked it. He he blurbed it for me. <laughs> uh, but yeah, and I've I have uh, I know Roman Catholics. I mean the the integralist Roman Catholics won't like it because they essentially want to turn the country into a European socialist. I, well, that might not be fair, but whatever. But the, I think that we have a, uh, within pockets of this country, um, a strong Christian presence, at least in terms of numbers. And because we have a federalist system, uh, things can happen at the state and local levels. Um, and I was hoping that this book would kind of energize, revitalize those people so that at those levels they can, they can achieve some great stuff. So, uh, yeah, like if we're not going to in the foreseeable future achieve much in New York city or San Francisco, uh, but there are places in, um, Oklahoma and, uh, other States that, uh, we, we can, we can achieve some things or at least fight for it. So that, that, that was the, the idea. And, uh, I, 
I, I know that the, the thing is, is like a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of Roman Catholics and they actually bring up NatCon. There was a whole panel at NatCon a couple of years ago um, of Roman Catholics and they all recognized that they were in a Protestant country. So they were criticizing the ne the integralist uh, for not recognizing the fact that they, they live in a Protestant country and all these guys are like, look, we're in a Protestant country. And, and I've, you know, I'm very, I, I didn't say anything like we're going to round up Roman Catholics in the book. In fact, I, I don't mention them, I don't think too often, but I would tell them right now, honestly, that I don't, I see no reason why in a Protestant country in today that we'd have to harm or harass Roman Catholics at all. Um, but in, I think, yeah, so in a, in a confident Protestant country, um, you can you can do that. Same thing with Jews. I think that the United States, I don't know the history of Jews in the United States very well, but as I understand it, and a Miles or someone can correct me, but they've they've done fairly well in terms of their political liberties. They've they've achieved office very early on. I think Miles, you tweeted about this before, um, and that was happening in the midst of a very confident Protestant majority and Protestant you know de facto establishment. And so I think it's very possible for non Christians to do very well in this country, and. Mm -hmm. Uh, but at the same time, recognize that the institutions are Christian or, or you know, Protestant. Uh, and that's that's how I that's kind of how I envision things going forward, uh, especially, you know, hopefully at the local and state. Levels. But what does that mean for a, an institution beyond the church to be Christian or Protestant? I mean, same thing like an educate like a school. I'm sure they're like down my kids go to a private school and they call it a classical Christian school and they call yeah. it Christian because it. It includes not only theological and cate catechism uh, elements, but also that it treats every subject like it, the totality of the of what's taught is Christian, even though it's you know what much of it's just human, like math. Two plus two is, is four is not is just a human truth. Um, right, but is it run by the church? No, no, it's not. Okay, so it's run by who? Uh, schoolmaster, headmaster. No, but I mean, what's the board? I mean, but, but I mean, it's, it, it does become a question of you can talk about an institution being Protestant or, or Christian or something, but then, okay, how is a company Christian? How is a county government, how is a county public health agency Christian? These are institutions. And just to sort of throw around the blanket term, oh, these can be Christian then actually requires some work about, okay, so people have to be members of churches to occupy offices in these institutions, or these have to be run by churches under the oversight of churches. No, you're asking for a churchly institution, not a Christian one, which is no, that all that is Christian is synonymous with the church. No, uh, but uh, the, the Bible, the New Testament knows only one Christian institution. That is the church. So if you're going to talk about other institutions being Christian, you have to somehow get some of the stuff that goes along with being a church, which is what evangelical colleges are. They sort of require students who, who apply to af affirm the faith. They require faculty to affirm some sort of uh, doctrinal test. They require board members probably to be members of certain churches. So there are ways in which they still use the church to try to have Christian uh, boundaries on those institutions. Can I, so can that, I, that's a Roman Catholic assumption, is is it not? I mean, the, no, the idea not a, that, that no, it's a Protestant. Every, everything it's has Protestant. to then fall under. No, it's not Protestant. But, you tell but, me Wheaton College is is Roman Catholic? No, this is the way. Pro no, no, I'm saying, I'm saying you, you, in order, operating. Yeah, well, your your claim is that that any institution, in order for it to have the qualifier of Christian, has to be formally. Uh, attached to some inst ecclesial. I'm, I'm asking if that's uh, the case, church. but even if no, they're not, not. formal, no, not. even if the they're not down formal, the road isn't affiliated with the church, right. but, they, but, but they even if Christian they're not things. formally attached, they're trying, they're using pieces of church life, doctrine, uh, creeds, uh, some kind of affirmation. M officers have to be members of certain churches. They're using church affiliated aspects to maintain the christian identity of those institutions and i'm sure that's the case at your school even though it's not under the oversight of a church it's still drafting on churches i mean but, okay but that's not yeah the, of course they, they they use dogmatic or they use doctrinal statements or they, they so, use so then apply that to the to the county health board and it's going to be a christian okay. county health board so that means 
those people are going to be members of churches and they're going to sign a statement of faith and whatever. But well, no, I, not can necessarily. I, can a Catholic hospital be Catholic? Well, now, Stephen's book does say that in his ideal Christian nation with the Christian prince, that you wouldn't necessarily be able to teach in a public school if you weren't a Christian, uh, and that you you might be you know pr pr privileged yeah. on jobs uh, if if yeah, you're a Christian. Sure, yeah. So you know, uh, so I'm thinking as a session member, okay, if I excommunicate this man, this husband, from our church, and we do excommunicate people, we've done it any number of times. We practice church discipline. Uh, then he loses his job, and his family either becomes a ward to the ward of the state or a ward of the church. Um, that, ever, that, that shouldn't that shouldn't that dynamic should not be something that a local church has to deal with. Have you ever excommunicated racist before? No. And if you did, would he lose his job? Do you think he loses? No, no, his no, job? no, no. In your in your ideal no, no, Christian no. Well, prince, well, you, but you would be okay with that. Would you, you be okay with a racist who lost his job at a school? I wouldn't. No, I you wouldn't. Would not be, you would be okay. You would not. So let's say he's a headmaster of a school. No, would you be but, okay but if we're the not headmaster community. of the school who's racist getting fired from his job? I'd like to. I I, I got to have some evidence. I'm guessing you guys actually would be happy for that. And you no, probably excommunicate no, him I'm as not. well. So, no, I'm, I'm so not don't, happy. They, don't bring up this, this scenario. The, and of the course, two wouldn't be tied okay together. The two situation. wouldn't be tied together. We don't report. We don't. Our business is not the state's business. In your republic with a Christian prince who approves of council's decisions and enforces them and can and can ignore them. I mean, it says so in your book. I'm sure. I mean, that John Witherspoon actually suggested to the Georgia that the Georgia Constitution amend itself so that any clergyman who had been defrocked would be disallowed from holding civil office. But that's what I'm talking about. If you like that, if you want that, fine. I'm telling you as a church officer, I don't want that to have to, I, that's 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 being under the state even if there's no established religion i don't know how uh, it's under the state doesn't does it not speak to the the character of, of the person but synods and councils air okay that's something that to, someone's livelihood should not should not depend on whether uh he's excommunicated from a church or a member of a church and that's what you all want but that's but that's not particular to them. That's a fair criticism. But this happened well into the 1930s. Yeah, so, well, so, so, I'm so sure I, it did. I wasn't for it then either. Okay, but that, then, then that's not theocracy. I, I didn't say it was. I yeah, didn't so, say but, it was. But so the, so the question is like, okay, so so again, what are we what are we bothered by? Right? Are we bo are we bothered by you know the the, the fact that you know, we've kind of arrived at a paradigm, you know, uh, I mean, I'll just lay my cards on the table. I, I, I'm, I'm, I am, I don't like racist. I'm from North Carolina. We made so much progress over 30 some years. Uh, I remember the difference. So yeah, I would want a, a guy who's open racist to get fired. I would also probably say that depending on what he says, maybe he should be excommunicated too. So I, so I think that we're, we're, we're there's all this kind of theory Here's the thing. The state and the church do overlap on some level because, for example, marriage exists, right? Marriage is a civil institution and it's a religious institution. This is where I, I actually think Calvinists get this way wrong uh, historically. The idea that marriage can exist is merely a civil institution. Uh, it, you know, civil marriage didn't exist in Britain until 1859. And so on some level, marriage is religious and marriage is civil. And so the state and church have to get together on that. So you can't exist. In, there is no society where this has actually not been the case, unless you actually live in a post-Christian and probably post-liberal society or a pre-Christian and pre-liberal one. So I think this is, again, this is all, this is ide idealized that there's no connection. Um, and I just don't think it can be, it can exist like that. So you have to deal with the reality on the ground that these two things do coexist in some ways. And for example, I'll give the example of a Presbyterian hospital. If you go to uh, downtown Charlotte, you will find Presbyterian Hospital. It was founded by the Presbyterian Church in the 1890s. Uh, two different Presbyteries got together and six big churches gave funding for a Presbyterian hospital. Was that not a Presbyterian hospital? Now, Daryl, I think would write would be right to say they're riffing off the church. I think that's completely fair. 
but I still think you have the established fact of a hospital that's meaningfully Presbyterian. Not it's anymore. Not. Yeah, but that doesn't. But but they again, couldn't. no. But they couldn't keep it. That's a, that's part of the problem with trying to make secular institutions Christian. Over time, you can't keep it because modernity, professionalization, all sorts of things happen, so that you need a doctor. And it isn't a Presbyterian doctor. You need a doctor. We no, all want the, we all want Jew doctors. Everybody knows the Jew doctors are best. Come on. I don't, I don't like like I don't think there's anything wrong with me actually liking the idea <laughs> of sharing funny. a faith with my doctor. I don't, I don't know why I don't know why that's like like no, but no, I'm saying for it to be a Presbyterian hospital. I mean, you know, if you want to say, oh, it doesn't mean that people there don't have to be that that. It doesn't mean they have to be Presbyterian. Then what the heck are you doing calling it Presbyterian? Well, so so if the doctors aren't Presbyterian, the nurses aren't Presbyterian, the uh, the, 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 uh, the janitors aren't Presbyterian, and they and all the patients, you know, ten percent are Presbyterian. What makes it a Presbyterian hospital then? I mean, what makes it not a Presbyterian hospital? The fact that people aren't devout. I mean, I mean, I, the, or the fact that people aren't church members. I think again, if, if I'm asking for every Christian institution to be litigated on churchly terms, that's not going to be the case. But I don't think that every Christian institution is actually needing to be run on churchly terms. But Christian states, Christian nations were litigated on churchly terms. Up until 1829, you couldn't vote in elections. You couldn't go to Oxford and Cambridge unless you were a member of the Church of England. Well, yeah, but the, but the, there is some problem with the analogy. I mean, the analogies. It's actually, it's actually 18, 1854 on Oxford. The, the, uh, well, Roman Catholic. The analogy only, only goes so far because when we're talking about doctors and what it takes to be a good doctor, there's a particular skill set that we're we're referring to for that they'll be good at their jobs with magistrates and civil authorities and civil participation uh, there is necessarily a more direct spiritual element uh, for the reasons I, I laid out before so it's more no, relevant. no I, I disagree but, I disagree that's, and, that's fine and, just make, no just, but I just I just taught a book today in post-cold war America on LA police and homicide detectives and the best detectives give no sign of having needed to be Christian to figure I'm out. About I'm talking, I'm talking about we're, we're talking around and about, uh, you know, tests for civil office tests for the select. You, you don't think a police officer has something to do with civil government. This is no, the legitimate use of force by the state and some of the best practitioners of, I didn't of say that either. Criminal, I said that I, I'm saying that these analogies only go so far to the central issue that we were talking about. Well, maybe they just go in a direction you don't like them to go because no, not it's not either. it's not apparent that that you need to be a Christian to be a good magistrate. It is. A, it is. A, well, it is apparent, at least to the, the furthest extent that the magistrate is called. Political uh, philosophy doesn't say that. Yeah, you know, the long I, I, history I remember, of political theory some, doesn't say that, and you know yeah, that. Yeah, it does it actually. Does, no, it does, does actually. I mean, Cicero says that it's it's a chief job of the civil authority to promote religion, so it is inherent. Which uh, religion was that? Which religion was Cicero promoting? Right. I'm just saying the principle. False application. Good principle. Yes, I mean this is what William Prince says: is they're they're right in in. Uh, you know, in the principle, but wrong in the subject or in the application. So the point is that in political philosophy, this actually is a perennial insight going back to the ancients. And so it's just a question of, you know, which, which not whether it is part of the job. Uh, that doesn't mean everyone uh, alike performs it correctly. And that doesn't mean it necessarily legitim delegitimizes their authority uh, in that sense. I mean, we should see bad rulers as a sign of judgment and those that aren't promoting true religion as the same. So, so I'd also like to point out that so we have, you have a civil government, you have different agencies, different departments. The fact that maybe like one department isn't like you don't have a test for office for that department doesn't mean the totality of it can't be Christian. Just like you teach math and don't you don't have to reference the Bible when you teach math. Um, but, but all the other still, departments still, still, would but, require Christian. Well, I, I'm just saying that the parts, not you know, it's a it would be. What was that? Would that be a composition? I always get division, composition confused, especially at 1130. Okay, night. so the, but anyway, dog, the, the, the point dog catcher, is that <laughs> the dog catcher or the pothole filler. Yeah, for, for something, something to be, uh, some, you know, to characterize something as in terms of the whole of it, the wholeness of it doesn't mean that each part has to be 
the same as the whole. So that's just a you know fallacy. But the the point being is that you have you have a Christian magistrate, and then the standards of do, of the uh, you know the guy who mows the lawn at the, at the dog park doesn't you know make will be different than others. But that's just a minor point. I you know. All right. So you know we're we're over two hours. I don't I don't think we're going to get anywhere else that we haven't gotten. Um. I, I, I think that uh, the the churchly versus the political um, versus you know and I, Stephen, I, I appreciate you you hanging with us. I don't think you have too much imagination um, in in your in your academic work. I think you have too little too little about what people will do with it and what the logical conclusion of it is, what the extension of it is. I, I'm concerned about the extension of it in 2024, what people will do with it, what expectations it will create. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to be hard to pastor and shepherd people through this next year, which is going to be hellish, no matter which way it breaks. It's going to be a nightmare. We still have to get along with our neighbors. We still have to uh, witness to them. We still have to minister to them and be neighbors to them. And I don't think and I'm, this is this is the last I'll say. I just don't think Christian nationalism aids that at all. We don't like the providence we've been handed, but it, we are here, uh, and we need to be we need to be thoughtful and biblical uh, with our solutions, not just um, not just uh, you know historical. I mean, we we do live here now. And we have to deal with what we what we've been handed. So, so Brad, just just to be clear, as I think this could be a, an important point of conciliation, is it's you don't have a problem, at, at least it, on the main in general, with Stephen's book in principle. But your problems, your critiques are about practice and context and prudence. No, I, I have both. But you know, I was going to say okay. I thought earlier I was going to say this, and this is the imagination thing I'm talking about. If, if we could elect a Christian prince tomorrow, I would probably elect Stephen Wolf. But what we're going to get, if we ever get it, is somebody that's three notches lower on the, on the uh, intellectual level and five notches lower on the, on, the, on the ethical level. I mean, look at history, look at our country, look, look, at, every, look at your daily life and ask if you want to, inst if, you, if you're going to put your trust in a Christian prince, uh, and how long how long that's going to last? We don't need to fall in love with snapshots in time, you know, eighteen minutes in fifteen eighty nine when things were perfect in Scotland. They weren't then; uh, they never were. And we, we, I think we 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 need to deal with the providence that we're handled. We do need to again be concerned for the practical daily lives of the people in our care. And uh, that's all I'll say. I don't have any malice uh, for anyone, but uh, that's my perspective. And whether I've whether I've expressed it clearly or not, uh, we'll see. Yeah, I, I, I think that. I mean, fundamentally, we need to trust our people. I mean, I trust the lady in my church to read things responsibly. I trust. I trust my church. I don't even like everybody. That, in my that's church. because Anglicans don't have total depravity, Miles. <laughs> we're not. Yeah, we're not totally blind. Uh, no, but I, I think very seriously. Like, I mean, I, I cannot tell you that I love everybody I go to church with. I really, you know, I, I, you know, I go to church with a bunch of Midwesterners. I'm, I'm from the South. And I'm just like sometimes I'm like, man, y'all are like vanilla. But so I don't even like everybody I go to church with all the time. But I, I think I trust, I trust the laity to read things responsibly. And I think that I think the church has to have space to read things, even controversial things responsibly. So I think on, on some level, again, again, I, my final say is I think a lot of this is, is a debate over philosophy of history. And it's, uh, it really has a lot to do with sort of the sociological backgrounds of where people are coming from maybe. So maybe that, maybe that's a caution. Maybe Stephen's book is, is not for uh, cert certain people. But I don't know if that's my job as a churchman to make that decision. Sometimes I just think that, you know, we, we have to trust everybody. Um, and uh, I I mean, Stephen, you can text me and I can tell you uh, we don't have each other's numbers. You can we can disagree about a lot of stuff. But I, I, I think fundamentally um, we can trust the laity uh, to make responsible decisions. 
um, and that a lot of what the church should actually worry about is 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 the gospel. Um, and so if people in our church are reading, I mean, my, my senior warden is a Straussian. Um, I'm on Vestry. And so I don't like Strauss. I don't like Jaffa. Uh, but I, I, I would trust him to read a lot of stuff. So I think some of it's just trusting the laity. Um, and I think that's a good principle moving forward for everybody. I don't really like Strauss or Jaffa either. <laughs> There's another point of view. Wow, we just all came to an agreement. Yeah. So, so Brad... Um, why? Because they're not. So I, I'm I, I'm looking forward to you standing up in, at the PCAGA and and uh, nominating me for Christian Prince. So that would be really wonderful. I'll be watching. Well, no, no, we'll, no. We'll make sure I, it's I saw on Twitter, but. I saw Michael O'Fallon's conference and uh, James Lindsay was nominated to be the Christian Prince by the Baptist Church in Florida. So it's uh, well, all, all good princes have to earn their. I guess crown. he and I have to single fight combat, to the so death. Uh, yes, yeah, single just combat announced. is the way. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not going to be lured into this kumbaya moment. I I really don't. <laughs> I don't trust a Christian prince. I believe in limited government, and I believe the Presbyterian government is also limited government. And I see the Christian nation proposal that Stephen is proposing is much more on the order of big government. And America was a rejection of European style big government. Now we've changed. We've changed a heck of a lot in ways that I really don't like. But still, limited government is in the bones of our founding order. And I think that's important. And I don't think Christianity giving us a Christian prince is in any way going, going to help preserve limited government. All right. Well, let's let's stop there. Uh, Ray, Resby, you've been in and out. Are you are you still with us? I'm like mold, man. All right. Good. Well, <laughs> thank thank everyone, and, um, and we're not going to. You know, the haters can they'll just have to suffer through the outro music as long as it is and whatever it is. And uh, but thank everyone, and we do thank uh, Stephen, Tom, and Miles, and. Uh, Daryl, who's probably been on 30 shows now, but um, he'll be on, there'll be another one after this. Presby. Thank you, everyone, for coming on. Don't be a nerdman. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts is the Lord. In all your little towns there shall be ways streets they shall cry they shall call the farmers to morning I will pass through the midst of you I take no delight in the noise of your solemn ascent woe to you who desire the day of the Lord Why would you have the day of the Lord It is darkness and not light Is not the day of the Lord a darkness And gloom with no brightness in I take no delight in the noise of your solemn self Accept them and the peace offerings of your fatted beasts. I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the sound of your harps, I will not listen. I take no delight in the noise of your solemn assembly. But let justice roll down and righteousness like ever flowing streams.
What's wrong with you people?